Good morning, fish keepers. Cam here from the fishroom.co.nz. We've done it. We've made Friday. Let's celebrate with coffee. Ah, it's way too hot to drink like that. Whew. All right. Okay. Not going to muck around too long because we have a guest on for you today. So we'll bring on John and we'll bring on Graham from Aquarium Adventures. How's it going? Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to both of you. Yeah, good morning, evening. I don't know what time it is. This was the most confusing oh. thing I've done for a while. <laughs> yeah, the the time structures and schedules for these always confuse me as well. Yeah. Uh, the, you'd be amazed, again, the amount that I consult with John. So, hey, is that the right time that I'm asking this person to be on? I'm not quite sure where we're, where we're at. And then... Um, Daylight savings is going to change for us in a couple of weeks' time, so that's going to confuse me again for another few months. Yep. Excellent. We worked it out in the end, though. Yep, we got there in the end. All right, cool. So what got you involved in keeping aquariums? Where did that start for you? Oh, um, I should have known. I should have prepared an answer for this one. <laughs> Normally, people say, oh, it started when I was a kid, but it didn't really. I did have an aquarium when I was a kid. Uh, or I thought I did, but every time I tell this story, my dad then comes back and says, no, you didn't. We didn't, we didn't <laughs> allow you to have an aquarium. So I think I had one, not sure, but then when I got my own house, that was probably the first time I got one. And I had a tank for years, but it was one of those, you have an aquarium, but you're not a fish keeper. You just have a tank that sits in the corner of the room and it grows algae. And then every couple of months, you scrape it all the way. It wasn't until I got my first discus, but mm -hmm. I think I got into it properly because it was an expensive fish as a Scotsman. I um, don't like spending money, so this was a big investment for me. So I was like, right, I'm going to make sure I know how to keep these. And obviously I bought them from a backstreet fish shop and they were terrible quality and got really sick. So I spent weeks and weeks on the internet researching all the things that you tell people not to do. Research before you buy the fish, not after you buy the fish. But that, that's what got me into it because I spent ages on all the forums back then, as it was, asking people questions, just being a sponge, trying to soak up as much information as I could. Mm -hmm. And then from there, got more and more into discus, then got multiple tank syndrome, got more and more tanks. And then 15, 20 years later, here we are. I've got, a, yeah. got my own fish room and everything. Yeah. And make videos about fish now. Well, it's just it's <laughs> very, very weird. It's, it's, it's kind of weird when you think about it, that people want to watch other people talking about about things. I know. It's just yeah. But we're all united from the same same love and the same same passion of of keeping things in glass boxes, essentially. Exactly. I think so. Yeah, and it, and it was it was finding that community of people who were kind of into the same thing without shame. Whereas your normal friends, you'd be like, I'm not going to tell them about all the fish tanks that I've got. I'll just keep that to myself. Yeah. And then obviously, I know, I'll just make videos about myself and put it on the internet. And then that, that'll that tell them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah, feeling I, strong thing, the um, the normals and the fish keepers. That, the normals, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We divide between the two, so to speak. I think, and I think it's getting more normal now. I mean, not to maybe the extremes of this and having lots of tanks but i think it is more normal that people are interested in it as a hobby especially after lockdown i found lots mm -hmm. of people got into it and just having something to do and something to care for and bringing a bit of nature inside and all that kind of stuff seemed to maybe make it a little bit more mainstream i don't know yeah it, it's a weird hobby because like if you don't want to tell anyone that you keep fish nobody in the world will know yeah because it's in your in your house, and if you don't have people come over, or you've got it in your fish room, or whatever, no one will ever know. Yeah. Because of the logistics of fish tanks being so big, maybe one event, one expo, or two expos a year sort of scenario, compared to like coin shows, which in a suitcase everyone's set up sort of thing. So like, yeah. if you don't want people to know you've got fish, you can keep it really quiet compared to other hobbies which go outside and out and about, and people see you doing it. So. Well, I worked um, for a company for three years, uh, just a small business, and I, it wasn't until about a week before I left that job that I found out my boss had two aquariums in his house. <laughs> I, I was gutted. 
I probably wouldn't have handed my notice in if I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's only, only in the last maybe year or so that I've started telling, or people have started to find out that I'm a weirdo with lots of fish tanks. <laughs> and now people will start sending me the odd email from work saying, oh, uh, my dad's got a koi pond. How do I do this? And yeah. that kind of stuff that kind of creeps yeah, in the now. The go-to guy, the fish guy. Yes, I used to be the go-to guy for all my friends and family whenever their computer broke. Now I'm the go-to guy for all the computer geeks when their fish tank breaks. So yeah. it's a crazy world. <laughs> what what got you started or inspired to start your YouTube channel? Well, the YouTube channel was... I think I'm going into my 10th year of having a YouTube channel. But maybe the first four years of that were me uploading the odd video every now and again with a 30 second clip of a fish so as i could look at it myself six months later to see whether it had got bigger change color change size all that kind of stuff and the thing that triggered it for me was that at some point i got to 300 subscribers and i wasn't trying to get subscribe i wasn't doing youtube and then i thought i don't know 300 people how, how has this happened? Who are these people that are watching me? And I got all self-conscious about it and kind of stopped for a while. And then <laughs> thought, oh, well, I suppose I watch other channels about people keeping fish to find out how to do things. So there is something there. And then made the odd video where I actually put in some information or this is this sort of discus and this is why I'm keeping it like this. And they got a little bit more traction and then snowball effect just yeah. ended up getting bigger and bigger and bigger to... Yeah, but it was that 300 subscriber thing where I was like, I don't, that, that's, that blows my mind. Um, and then it became a hobby in and of itself. So mm -hmm. as much as fish keeping is a hobby, I, I'm into tech and gadgets and things like that anyway. So it's a bit of a hobby just to try and beat the algorithm every now and again or learn what makes one video work and another video not work and see if mm -hmm. I can recreate that. But it's always, it stopped at the hobby. It's not... I don't think it's ever going to be something that's more than a hobby for me, the YouTube stuff, because it's, I would have to do things so differently to go really big. And majority of my videos are me doing something in my fish room and filming it rather than, yeah. right, let's come up with a plan of something that will go viral. Every now and again, I'll try and think of something that might be a fun video, but the majority of it is man does think to fish tank and films himself doing it and puts it on the internet. And it kind of works. I can find little spaces in the day or the week to make a video every now and again. So I'll just keep doing it while I do. The um, thing is, I mean, you've got to do the work in the aquariums anyway. So why not stick a camera on a tripod and, and get on with it and then edit it? Later yeah. On? It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy that I, I justify all the fish tanks by saying, well, I have to have things to film. And then I justify <laughs> the film saying, well, I can't have all these fish tanks and not film them. So, you know, come back in 10 years and I'll have 300 fish tanks. <laughs> how was sorry how was the process for you for recording a video does, does that is it just all of a sudden how i'm about to do this i'm going to set something up or a little bit of thought the day before kind of scenario uh, a bit of both so i will have ideas every now and again and i, I do keep a book down here that when i go oh that would be fun and i write it down and then they are the kind of videos that get made six months later because I never find time to make the effort to make that video. And then there's the, right, I need to clean out this sump. Yeah, I'll film it and see if I can make that interesting in some way. And they are the ones that take me a couple hours to do the job and to film it and then maybe a couple hours to edit it and upload it. That can just be churned out almost. The other ones where, oh, the last video I did was I bought a load of crap off Timu and built a fish tank with it. That was something that took a bit of planning because I had to go and buy the stuff and wait for it to arrive and then get it all ready and set up. So I think that kind of works for me where I have a bit of both of those types. Mm -hmm. um, so the process is, I'm a very, very lazy man. So anything that takes too much time or too much effort is going to be difficult to convince me to do it regularly. So it has to be something that I can just kind of do on the side. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it works so far. As long as it stays enjoyable and it doesn't become something that you depend on being successful, yeah, because then yeah. That, you got to get out of bed and make videos. Whereas right now it's it's, it's fun and it's all being everything works in harmony. So 
I think that that's a big part of it as well. And a lot of people have said to me that the, one of the things they like about the channel is that I'm not necessarily pushing it. I'm not going to be the most effervescent guy going, hey, guys, welcome. Yeah, this is great. It is very much, yeah, this is a thing. And it's when companies are sending me things, I'll, I'll often say, this is actually rubbish. And they'll go, oh, how can you say that? They'll never work with you again. Like, oh, well, don't care. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of the best videos I've had is where I've done that and the company's changed the product. And I no, think that's no. the best kind of marketing you can get is, oh, they listened and now it's better. Um, so that's great. I, I think if you're being honest in those type of videos, people will believe when you're good, you're, you know, you're big enough yeah. product because they'll say, well, he was harsh on that last product, but he's good on this one. So it's honest. Yeah, and I think it comes across well too. So well, recently I did one on Fluval's new CO2 thing and it didn't yeah. work. So I had to say it didn't work. Like they've sent me loads of stuff in the past, but this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And they've come back and they've said, oh, yeah, you're right. We'll, we'll fix that. Send it back. Let's have a look at it. We'll do some more research because they want to make sure they're not sending out rubbish to everyone else. Cool. And that's what I want to work with. Yeah. When you do your slightly longer form videos, ones with a little bit more planning, mm. how, many, how many times have you deleted content in the process without realizing? Because that is a problem that I have. Is it a common occurring thing for you as well? There's a few categories of things that I will do. So as well as being a very lazy man, I'm a very clumsy man. So quite often <laughs> in the process of out of the camera and getting it into the computer, I'll drop it and stand on it or drop it in a fish tank and kill it that way. <laughs> <laughs> or I will forget to plug in the microphone. So I'll have 20 minutes of me sat going. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm going to have to do a voiceover for this. I guess, hey, hey, when you, you sit down to edit it after you've just done a, a full demonstration of a product, which you can only do the once, and then realize you've no sound. Yeah, the last one I did there, that unboxing all that stuff from Timu, uh, I'd accidentally flicked my camera into 4K mode and the autofocus doesn't work on 4K, so it was just constantly going like this. Mm. So I had to do some artful editing and cut out all the bits where it was out by shooting oh, loads wow. of extra bits of B-roll. And oh, yeah, the amount of times I'd not so much lose, but just record something that's truly terrible and I can't put it out. Um, yeah, it's quite high. <laughs> but I have very low standards, so that works in my favor too. <laughs> my, my frustration builds up when my phone tells me that I'm running out of storage and I just bulk delete everything really quickly and then, oh wait, I needed those yeah. two clips and I've gone forever. Yeah, no, it does happen more than I'd like it to. <laughs> uh, discus, why, why, why discus? Why have they become your, your favorite fish and where's your journey? What's your journey with them? Um, well, <laughs> I think they're my favorite because they were the ones that actually got me into it. So yeah. while I had kept fish before, I hadn't really cared about fish before them. And then after keeping discus, I've cared about all the fish that I've kept. It was the thing that kind of got me to think, right, there's more to this than just a decoration in the corner. Um, it was the thing where I had to do the most amount of studying, so to speak, um, to learn how to keep them well and what made them better. And everything about them amazed me. When I was the new disc keeper, uh, discus keeper, I thought they were fantastic. They're just these amazing things that float in air, so serene and beautiful looking. And then when I got them to breed, the fact that the, the fry, when they go free swimming, go around them like a cloud and the way they look after the fry, it, all of it blew my mind. And I just thought, this is, this is brilliant. I've since found out that lots of other fish are brilliant also, but they were the ones that kind of... I think it was just because they were first is what's made them my favourite, and yeah. that's why they're in the tank that's closest. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, do you have any specific sort of key requirements for keeping them them healthy and happy? Like they're, they're well known to be sort of finicky. How have you overcome that sort of thing with them? They are. Um, I think they're well known to be finicky and that that's maybe a bit of a an urban legend that's not quite as true as it maybe used to be. I think a lot of the experienced people and older textbooks and books and things like that were written were about wild discus and importing them. And they do have a little bit more of care requirements. The majority of your um, 
domestic discus that are whatever they might be Asian or German in the past or whatever they might be. They're just almost as hardy as any other cichlid, to be fair. I've had tanks where I've forgotten to turn off a water um, refill tap and it's ended up running cold and I've come down and they've been at kind of seven degrees Celsius. Um, and they've been like, oh, it's a bit chilly, Graham, but we're fine. And they've recovered okay. Or I've had filters crap out on me and they've been fine. Um, there are, obviously, the basics are, yes, they like it a bit warmer. They appreciate clean water, but I've never met a fish that didn't appreciate clean water. So I, I kind of rule that out as a, a specific mm. requirement for discus. They just do like it. Yeah. The thing that I think people get wrong more than anything else is they don't feed them enough. They're very um, voracious feeders, in my experience. And a lot of um, advice that I was given was, yeah, feed them once a day. And if they haven't eaten everything you've given them within five minutes, take it out. And for the years and years that I've been keeping discus, they've all been grazers. You put in the food and they take an hour to get around it. They will get around it, but an hour later, they're ready to go again. They are very, very demanding feeders. Um, there's been lots done on what the diet of discus should be and the, the arguments about should you feed them things like beef heart and I get those arguments. Yes, they're not eating beef heart in the wild, but these are also not wild discus. Um, I don't feed beef heart, but I don't have anything against people who do because it's people that are just trying to create a diet that is um, nutritionally beneficial. If you just fed them everything they found in the wild, that would be very hard to do. And whatever you're recreating with it, I think it's just a case of getting a good balance in there and making sure you're giving them something that works rather than anything else. So I would say all the stuff about 100% water changes twice a day, don't need that. Yes, keep their water clean, but 32 degrees all the time, don't need that. Yes, it needs to be a bit warmer. Um, other than that, go for it. They're cichlids at the end of the day. They're like any other cichlid that's going to have a barney. They're going to have a, a fight with anything else that's in the tank and they can put up with, <laughs> stick up for themselves just as good as any other fish. Mm -hmm. Have you found them any more prone to disease or illness than, than other fish or cichlids? Not, not necessarily. Um, when I have had bouts of disease, or, or the majority of the stuff that I see on the internet is people who have cross-contamination issues where they get them from two different sources and there'll be a pathogen that lives in one source that doesn't live in the other. And then after many, many discussions, you find out they've mixed discus and that's why it's wiped out the tank rather than it being a husbandry care issue. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, as long as you're keeping the water clean, not necessarily these 100% water changes, I think they're quite hardy. And I know it's not a popular opinion, but mine have been. Um, I don't find them to be uh, worms, maybe. I don't know if they're any more prone than any other fish, but I've well, had that think, every now and again. Do you think when it comes to discus, there's that element of people that have kept them want to create this mystic mystery about them? Much Definitely. like people that keep saltwater aquariums love to put out this impression that it's, it's only for the the most skilled of elite fish keepers out there and an amateur can't do it because it's too difficult yeah you know? uh, the whole thing about you have to be an advanced fish keeper before you can keep discus uh, no it, well, it helps but you, if you're going to use that argument you should use it with every fish because every fish deserves some kind of level basic level of care yeah, uh, yeah. i don't think well, discus are anymore but the discus community especially when i was getting started it's a horrible place to be some of the discus groups on facebook back in the day were 90% of the posts on there were people shouting at each other about something or other rather than trying to be a community or trying to help each other. Um, it's very much an elitist thing, I think, mm -hmm. going on there. Definitely. I think um, Silver Creek's just brought up a pretty good point. Um, you feel that the mess of the hype comes with the cost and it drives a psychological way to want to spend more on their care yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And that also kind of trickles down into the... Um, the belief that they are the harder and they're kind of top tier kind of scenario and you've got to worm them in special treatment all that kind of stuff i think that builds into that hysteria as well at the same time if that makes sense 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think there are certain people with a mindset of, look, I've got a tank of discus. How fancy am I? I'm better than all you. And yes. They are the people that are putting out these messages. But yeah, they're not cheap. That is, you can't deny that. So if you are going to spend a lot of money on it, that does come with a bit of cachet, I guess, of, oh, I'm quite proud of myself. I've got this tank of expensive fish. You also touched on a really key point that I think very much it's an urban legend of that they're not hardy from many years ago when they were predominantly wild caught fish yeah. compared to the, the tank raised ones now. Um, and times have changed and genetics have gotten a little bit stronger in them and they are a significantly stronger animal than what they were yeah. many years ago yeah. where that sort of mythology came along from it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Certainly yeah. from anything I've seen recently, um, they're as hardy as any other. Cool. Uh, we've had another weak question here from Rochelle. What's the minimum size tank you'd need in your in your opinion when it comes to keeping discus? Uh, I hate answering these questions because it's like putting a rule <laughs> in there that doesn't really exist. But my preference is to keep them in a group. So a group of six is kind of my minimum. The more the merrier. And a group of six... I would say something like 180 litres, 200 litres. But within that, there's so many caveats of mm. what else you're putting in the tank with them, but how much decor, plants, how much space has been taken up by other things, how much filtration you're going to have, all, all these kind of things. But your general, call it a rule of thumb, as much as I hate that phrase, but kind of 200 litres for a tank of six with maybe a few other fish and good filtration and good husbandry, that should be okay. So this is the first time I've heard anyone say keep them in a group of six. All right. Why? 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 Why group of six? As good a number as any other, I guess. Um, <laughs> that's probably a hangover from some of the advice I was given in the past um, group because they do like to establish a pecking order, in my Agreed. experience. Cool. And if you have three, that picking order or establishing that picking order can get out of control quite quickly. So six spreads that aggression a little bit more. Um, I don't think there's any other reason other than that. And why wouldn't you want six? Why would you only want three? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. well aware that they have their own picking order and that process can be quite detrimental to the, the ones at the bottom of the yeah. row. Um, I was just curious on why, why six was was seed number four for that as I don't, well. I don't think I really have a, a good explanation for why six. Um, it's just a number that's always stuck with me and it works, so why not? So if you want to go with five, go with five. Yeah. That's what I say. I'm very much against giving rules out to people because I should have probably prefaced all of this by saying I am not an expert in anything. I'm at best an enthusiastic amateur and I'm more than happy to be told I'm wrong about most things, and I often am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I, pers- I know we're not talking about discus here, but the whole buy a group of tetras and a group of six, for example, I've always thought that that's just been a marketing ploy somewhere along the line to get someone to buy more than three, get them to buy six. Whereas tetras, for example, keep from six to a dozen, a dozen to 18, 18 to 30, completely changes the dynamics of the fish altogether yeah. the more the more the merrier and i'm suspecting it's probably the same with discus but yeah we always thought that was a wee marketing ploy to get someone to open their wallet from three to three to double the purchase it may well be i mean i have had situations where i've had three so if i've been quarantining some in one tank trying to breed it all into another tank and have had either pairs that weren't really pairs or threes and fours and they have just been at each other's throats constantly. So whether it's six is the number or not, or it should be eight or ten or five or four, I don't know. But twos and threes don't really work unless it's a pair for me. Mm. Mm. So we've had someone mention in the chat about your whakapapa. All right. And, and its ability to eat pellets. Yes, I'm very proud of myself for that one. <laughs> Uh, how did that come about? Because that can't be the most common claim to fame, per se. Uh, no. So he is my second for half a puff. For half a puff. 
easy for me yeah. to do, for Hacker Puffer. Uh, and the last one that I had got to a fairly decent size, but something went wrong. Um, but it always was a pain to feed because I would having to find a variety of foods with everyone on the internet telling me they were the wrong ones, no matter what it was. Feed mussels, people will tell you not to feed mussels. Feed clams, or oh, you don't feed clams. Prawns, no, you can't have prawns. And then the other people will be telling you to go for the other things. The I wanted to get pellets because I have pellets and can get easy access to pellets, and I can see on the back of the packet how much nutrition I'm getting in with each pellet, and that will work. And I wanted hard pellets because I wanted something that would keep their beaks worn down a little bit so that I could use things like shellfish and clams and prawns and whatever as treats rather than as a staple and because it was quite hard to use them as a staple not necessarily hard but it's a faff if you have to defrost things before you can feed your fish whereas if you can just open a packet or a tub and go there you go mm -hmm. that's a bit easier and I, I wanted to do it just mainly for that reason rather than some kind of esoterical oh this is the only way you can be doing it it was again my laziness driving me towards wanting to get something that worked and fit my routine well, it's obviously and how, how did, yeah how did that process go for you how long did that take and and where did that start it, it, it took a while um it was the same process i've used with lots of fish that i've tried to pellet train where i got him when he was quite small and he was being fed on chopped up muscle and bloodworm so when I got them, continued to feed the chopped up worm and uh, chopped up muscle and bloodworm, and then add in a pellet at the same time as feeding every now and again until he accidentally bit it and realised it was food, and then just slowly. And I think it took maybe two months before I could completely change. Just slowly upping the the volume of the pellet and lowering the bloodworms and the the muscles until we got something that we were happy with. I'm now trying to get him back onto things so as when I do put in a clam, he doesn't just stare at it for an hour and go, what's this thing in my tank? So, you know, it has there are pitfalls for this as well. Yeah. Um, what pellet are you feeding it? Or is it multiple now? Uh, a few different ones. Uh, the main one I have is the Hikari Cichlid Gold, I think it is, mm -hmm. the sinking one. Um, a lot of my fish feed that and I can get it at volume so that's kind of one of my staples again I, I think a variation in diet is more important than product X is the best product you should only feed this so I'm, I'm not precious about the pellet it's just what I have at hand and it works as well so yeah I think the best fish food is a fish food that your fish will eat number one priority yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good it is, if your fish aren't going to eat it, you're exactly. throwing money down the drain straight away. Yeah, I mean, I will get picky about things like if if something disintegrates really quickly or clouds up my tank or just makes a mess, then I'll probably steer away from them in the long term. But other than that, as long as it's got some nutritional value, isn't actually hurting them, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going for it. Yeah, fair call. Um, once accidentally dropped some rapashi into a tank full of pea puffers and i watched them pick at it from that moment onwards i was like cool i can do this i've never had it once happen again you've inspired me to try again <laughs> i think I just, the, I, the key for me and i've done it with lots of fish is uh, repetition so once they know it's feeding time so often when i get a new fish they, they're scared of me for a while so I, I try not to change anything too quickly and it's more about a case of going right when you see this big lump coming up to your tank i'm doing nice things i'm giving you food <laughs> here you go and then just slowly starting to drop in the things i actually want them to have yep fair. yeah sure. uh, what are some of the challenges you've had while having the the puffer or puffers um are, are they a, a a tricky fish to keep or are they fairly simple or how how's that gone about as far as key goes they have been fairly simple i think i i mean i have killed a few so i shouldn't i should probably qualify that before i give, start giving advice i would never really want to give advice on how to keep things but i've had a fahaka puffer that i had for years loved that fish i'm a fan of most puffers and um, i think they're a cool fish to have no real problems with them until I had a problem and he died. Mm. Same with uh, 
I had big plans to build a big massive fish tank, which I've now done, but I bought a m Mabu puffer and he died. Um, couldn't explain it. Talked to loads and loads of people about what could possibly have been going on, but no, we couldn't explain it. Didn't even get to any kind of size. Yeah. The biggest challenge I've had with them is you kind of need to dedicate a fairly large tank to them because they're going to get big and they're going to want a lot of space. So when you want to keep lots of fish, it's quite the commitment to say, right, I'm going to keep this five foot tank for nothing other than this thing that's this size at the moment, but is going to grow to this size. Yeah. Um, that's probably the biggest challenge. And speaking to folk at work in fish shops and things, that's what they get a lot of people bringing them in going, I bought this when it was only three inches long. And now look at the size of it. I've not got a big enough tank for this. You have it. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely something I personally struggle with is one big fish in a big tank. I want to put lots of little fish in a big tank. Yeah. Or medium, lots of medium sized fish in a big tank. So, like, I can, when I see people that have got bigger individual fish in big tanks, I, I can understand the discipline that goes into not want to go, uh, I want to change this. Or, oh, maybe I could have gone with something else as well. So, yeah, yeah there's also definitely a case of buyer's remorse when you, say right i am going to put that five foot fish tank and that's going to be for the hacker and then someone says oh do you want this group of x yep. and y you're like, oh if only it's, I it's always about always about three weeks later as well yeah why, why didn't you talk to me three weeks ago we, this is a totally different conversation yeah, yeah yeah but yeah i do like to have the the mix so obviously i've got a community tank with medium fish i've got individual fish and big tanks i've got a big tank with lots of big fish and yeah. i the next thing i probably do will be a big tank with lots of little fish so i'm not a monster fish guy or a nano tank guy i'm a bit of everything guy i think an equal opportunist fish keeper as Definitely. one of our previous guests one of our previous guests coined i'll take that Monica, as well yeah that sounds good yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I thought it was fantastic when you first said it <laughs> Uh, have you much have much experience with pea puffers? Yeah, I have kept them over the years. I've never uh, managed to keep them for a long time. Um, I've kept them and they have bred them before. No, I have kept them while they have produced babies. I, I was very much not involved in the process at all. It just kind of happened. Um, but yeah, I do like them. I just don't. They're not on the radar for the moment, though. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on keeping them in, in community tanks, as Rochelle's just asked? Um, well, lots of people will say anything with flowing fins or dangly bits, a pea puffer will see that as a potential meal. Um, I kept them with things like otosynclus and coolie loaches and even shrimp. If you have a nice densely planted tank, a population of shrimp seems to do quite well. They will pick off the odd shrimplet, but that always worked fairly well with me. But I, I, I have no experience of trying them with the other things because why risk it? <laughs> so I, I'm not an expert. I don't know. I've had success yeah. with them with um, rasporas. All right. And ember tetras as well. But yeah. I thought, I thought um, Otto Sinclair would always be a pretty good option with them. Um, never really thought about coolie loaches, but that kind of makes sense. Um, different parts of the water column, curly yeah. loaches are ridiculously good at hiding a million of them in a tiny little cave. So, plus, yeah. I think the the, the curly loaches make so much movement when they, they if they panic, they just go and the, the puffers don't like that. Peas, they just freak out at that. I've always like, found the the pea puffers, especially, are very much even when you're literally dangling something for them to eat, they'll take a good thirty seconds to size yeah. it up and go, "Is that food?" No, yeah. I'm not sure. Well, and if your fish, fish is fast enough to get out of the way, then you're okay. Yeah. If there was ever a fish that's a candidate to wear glasses, it's a pea puffer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this look like you should have the glasses on. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes uh, sense. Re like that. Rebecca would like to know: Is there going to be a second mega tank? Ah. Uh, <laughs> If my wife's watching, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have, and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. I'm one of these people that has ideas and writes them down and then 
18 months later, start doing something about it. So I have had an idea where in the background there is a couple of racks of tanks and there's maybe, I think, 15 feet worth of space there taken up. And I have an idea to say, well, once I don't have all these tanks doing things for me, that might be Mega Tank 2. And rather than being a, a wide tank, it'll just be a very, very long tank. So it might be a 12 foot by 2 foot by 2 foot rather than 8 foot by 4 foot by 4 foot or whatever. Yeah. And that was the idea I was talking about having a really big tank with really small fish and just having lots of tiny fish in an enormous tank. Because I just think that looks ridiculously good. It would. Certainly does. Yep. Yeah, my really only good. reticence is I've kind of maxed out the space I'm allowed in the garage. So this is my garage um, and I've turned it into the fish room. So I've taken it all of it. And if I do one big tank, that's kind of doing away with 10 smaller tanks that I can do things with. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of, can I do one mega tank with a row of tanks above it and build that in somehow? Or can I figure out a different way to convince the wife to let me extend that way and take up some more yeah. space that way. We'll see. I was going to ask, have you thought about extending the garage to extending the room you've got? Yes, but yeah. hell will freeze over before that happens <laughs> in this house. Dig down. <laughs> Dig down. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. You never know. Now, as much yeah. as my wife tolerates my hobby and is quite happy to let me enjoy it, when it gets to that kind of thing of, oh, you know, we've got the double garage and I've turned it into a fish room. How about a quadruple garage? <laughs> That's never going to go down well. No. Tolerate is a very good word there, I think. Tolerate. Yeah. Oh, that's, that, it's unfair. She's not anti fish keeping or anything like that. And she, well, she does tolerate it. She's happy for me to be happy enjoying my hobby. Her main thing is, like any of the other things, when the kids were younger or wanted pets and things let's get a dog let's get a cat let's get a lizard let's get whatever she would always end up having to be involved in cleaning said thing out whereas with all the fish tanks i do everything and she doesn't have to do anything so she's more than happy to let me get on with it yeah fair, fair. until it comes to extending buildings and things and then she's less happy <laughs> do you want to walk us through the process of setting up your solar powered barrel pond and how that came about uh, oh, I've done lots of solar powered things now with it. It, it came about with, in my old house, um, I had a little tiny front yard type thing that the wife wanted a water feature in it. And as soon as those words left her mouth, I was like, ah, so you mean a pond? <laughs> <laughs> and Stop. it was more to do with convincing her that I didn't need to power it. And it wasn't about over overpowering it with oh you need a filter box here and we need an electric junction box there and this that and the other it was it had to be simple and it had to be cheap and it had to be no ongoing costs and things like that so mm -hmm. it coincided with somebody some company sending me one of those cheap air powered um solar powered air pumps so i thought wow. oh well if, if i can move air i can move water so that'll provide some level of filtration and I tried that and it was fine. And then it was just refining that over the, the months and years to make it a little bit better and a little bit more powerful and a just kept going at it. And to the point where in my new house, I've got a big pond, which is solar powered as well. Um, and that's that's kind of peak solar power now. So that doesn't cost me any money to run, but it's a little bit more elaborate than the stick a solar panel in the ground and one wire going off to an air pump and away you go. But most of my projects are necessity. They are, yes, you can do that, but so once it's about finding how to get around the butts. Yep, I understand that. Um, other than the obvious power saving costs with solar power, what are some of the other benefits that you've noticed with, with running solar power? Is there other oh, benefits? I don't know. Um, I, I'm almost 100% coming at it from a cost perspective. It's That's one of the things that, if there is any friction in my marriage, it's often about how much does your fish room cost to run. Mm -hmm. So anything I can do to offset that by saying, oh, well, not that, because we're running it off the solar panels now, that's... Yeah. That's where it goes. Yeah. It's yeah. it's good that it kind of, 
I tried to make the argument once, and I don't even think I believe this, but it's good that it's coming from the point of view of I don't need to remember to set timers and things to minimise functions. So if it's sunny, it'll come on. If it's dark, it'll go off, and I don't need to think about it. So being in Scotland, is that an issue? Um, well, I, it is an issue. I, I'm in Sheffield, so I know I've got the Scottish oh, accent. Sorry. But, um, it's, it's not much sunnier down here, to be fair. <laughs> um, so it's the same kind of problems. Um, it, it is. So I had my first round at doing this pond was with a, a battery. So the solar panel goes into the transformer, then goes into the battery, and the battery runs the pump in the pond. And the solar panel tops up the battery. So I, I tried to size it all to make sure that I could get, if I got a decent day's worth of sun, it would run for a couple of days. So as then if I had a rainy day or whatever, I'd still have a little bit there. I way underestimated how much battery power I needed, how much I needed to store. Um, so it is a problem, but problems are there to be solved. Problems are opportunities. So just get a bigger battery. I like that option. Uh, hello, we just had a question from Helen. Oh, sorry. Hey, I'll do it. There we go. Cool. Uh, how long do you, your solar units last for? Well, so far, uh, a year, because I've only been running it a year. <laughs> so I can't testify for any longer than that. The batteries yeah. generally are the bit that wears out. Um, and they have, it will be in the specs of whatever battery you're looking for. They have so many cycles that they're rated for, whether it's yeah. charge and decharge 7,000 times or whatever it might be. And obviously, the more times it does that, the more expensive it is. The solar panels, in my experience, don't really wear out. It's more that newer ones that are more efficient and more um, generate more energy come out. So you might swap, want to swap them out for that rather than they stop working. They seem to be, the, certainly in the last few years, um, I, I only really got into it when people started putting them on their house to power their houses and yeah. look at it from that point of view. And it kind of translates down to the, the hobby size when you get the smaller ones as well. Um, so hopefully it will last a long time. There's no real moving parts and it's just the battery that's going to wear out. Uh, we have a comment from uh, the viewers uh, about 15 or so minutes ago. We'll just get to it now. Uh, I definitely noticed it straight away. Has anyone noticed that you haven't got a beer in your hand? I, I noticed. I was a little bit surprised personally as well. <laughs> so that's a Friday treat for me. Ah. Um, <laughs> so for those that don't know, I do my, my own live stream on a Friday night, and that's my end of week excuse to have a beer <laughs> it started off as a beer review thing where i used to drink um, regular beers and people kept saying oh that's rubbish don't drink that you should try these craft beers and i was always a bit like yeah no craft beer no i don't like it and now i'm very much like oh this is delicious i'll have more of this please uh, and it's just turned into my friday night thing so sorry brian i'm, I'm on the pepsi max tonight <laughs> People will start to speak if I have a beer on every single live stream. I've done. <laughs> and no, uh, Helen, no vodka in it. No vodka in it. Just back to the, the solar stuff. Uh, we get more constant sun here. So Helen's in, in New Zealand as well. She's five or so hours south from where I am. Uh, and so we, we get more constant sun here, even in the winter. Yeah. Would a battery be necessary? So again, I'll preface this by saying I'm not an expert in these things, but from the research I've done, if you were to go for a DC pump that was, or a DC power plant that was doing whatever you were doing to run the, the thing, then you don't need a battery. Um, I think all the solar panels that you get these days take the power from the sun and transmit that as DC, and then you have to convert that to AC to get your equipment to work. But there are DC pumps that would, so that would just be solar panel straight to pump. If there's sun, it will run. If there isn't, it won't. And that would be fine. That would work quite well. Um, the battery, if nothing else, is just turning that DC into AC through an inverter. And then the battery is the thing that actually holds that power and puts it out. So you could have a really small battery if you get lots of sun and it would just constantly be getting topped up. That would probably work quite well. Cool. 
how do you approach uh, breeding projects in your in your wee fish room? There is it occur? Do they happen? Do you plan for them? Um, I go through cycles of the hobby of. Okay, I'm get, I'm on a DIY thing, so I'm going to try and build things and make things, and then other times I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and breed things. Most of my successes, I've had very little to do with it, but things do breed, and that's generally what spurs me into doing it. So I've recently been trying to breed the discus and get them going again, with limited success. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, but most of it is. Like I say, I'm not an expert on these things. I, I'm I'm looking up how to breed Corydoras the same as Joe Bloggs, who's just got the first tank of Corydoras. So I'm Ooh. trying the things out every now and again to see whether they work. I've recently done a project where I wanted to 3D print uh, an egg trap for some zebra danios just because I thought that was a cool little idea of, oh yeah, they lay the eggs there, the, that then sucks them up into a breeder box and that, that works. So yeah, that, that's quite fun, and I enjoy that side of things. But I'm also, that same project, I'm also going, I don't want 10,000 Zebra Daniels, so I'm going to stop doing that now. Yeah. <laughs> Time to do it. And, uh, oh, now what do I do with all these fish comes on yes. afterwards. Yeah, I remember years ago, again, it's one of those things where breeding fish are like, wow, this is amazing. This is life happening right in front of my eyes. And I got into one of those situations where I had, wow, I've got 10,000 Crebensis. What am I going to do with all these Crebensis? Yeah, so I'm a bit reticent unless I have a plan to deliberately breed things. Yeah. Um, but hugely interested in it because I think it is a cool sight to see. Yeah, it's fairly hard to get rid of five Crebensis, let alone 10,000 of them. Tell me about it, yes. <laughs> Do you have any uh, future breeding projects or plans happening at the moment, or are you working towards anything? Not really. Like I say, I'm dabbling in, obviously, more more to do with the technology side of things, of with the Daniels and stuff, because you just kind of have to have water to breed Daniels. Um, mm -hmm. Same with the guppies. I like to... I've messed around with them, trying to see if I could like get strains to lock in and all that kind of stuff. But I don't have any real proper breeding projects going on at the moment. One of the ideas I was having with my big 10 foot, 12 foot tank here would be lots of tiny fish and maybe lots of discus, but I can't afford to go out and buy lots of discus, so I would have to breed them. So that might be a future project. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you manage your water quality in, in your fish room? Is it all automated or your manual bucket and hose sort of scenario? Yeah, it's kind of in between the two. Yeah. So I think I've been saying for about two years, and my next project will be setting up automatic water changes. <clears throat> I've Ooh. never quite got around to it. So my mega tank is my big tank. It's on an automatic water change, but all the other ones are all manual. Um, <laughs> That I, I don't do buckets, so I have various drain points where I just take hoses, dip them in tanks, siphon them out to a drain point, and then refill with float valves to make sure they don't overflow, because, again, I'm the most clumsy person in the world. I've flooded this room more times than I care to remember. I understand. Um, yeah. So many times. Uh, which is why I'm in the garage. I'm not allowed to have fish tanks upstairs anymore. Um but majority of them are, like I say, manual-ish. I go around and I do my tanks. This where I'm sat right now is where I do my day job. So I'll quite often I'll be doing a bit of work and go on a call, if it's a meeting or something like that, and I'll go and do one tank. So as I can do that in the background, then that's just happening. And then the next meeting I'll go away and I'll do another tank. And just I have a churn. I just work my way through each week, yeah. going around in circles, basically. Um, just out of curiosity, what do you do for a day job? The hugely exciting world of IT. <laughs> <laughs> it's none of those things. Uh, I'm a, a technical Ooh. delivery manager or solutions architect, depending what day you speak to me on. Cool. Or as I tell people, I draw pictures of clouds with lines coming out of them. <laughs> I can see those clouds too. Um, back to the water changes, do you find or have you found that because you've got your tanks already set up, it makes setting up the automatic water change just a little bit harder? 
as opposed to I've got blank canvases and it's part of the process of setting it up. I think it would definitely have been, well, it would have still been a challenge. It would definitely have been maybe easier to do it all at once at the start before I started filling tanks up. But I moved into this house a couple of years ago and had a smaller fish room mm -hmm. that I had to move here as well. So I already had fish and tanks that I needed to be running on day one, so I couldn't mess up. So I've always been kind of dancing around those ones as I've been trying to set up the next bit, and it's always been a bit of a faff. So a lot of these tanks down here that you can't see because the lights are off are already drilled. So I just don't fill them all the way up so they don't leak. Um, but it's just a case of getting around and doing all the plumbing. But then when I start thinking, oh, well, am I going to keep these or am I going to switch to a big tank? It gets pushed further down the road as, well, maybe not the next project. I'll do it another day. And I think because it works quite well, it's, it's nice having all my tanks so close. So it's not a chore of lugging buckets and hoses mm. and pipes from one room to another room. It's literally take it out of that one, put it in that one, drain that one, drain that one, onto the next one. It's not that much of a chore, so it's yeah. not that pressing to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something to be said about condensing all of your aquariums into one space as opposed to so. like a couple in every room. It yeah. just makes, like you said, that, that process changes from a chore to it. It's just a process of, and you can get it all done in the one space and it just flows a lot better. Ooh. Yeah, so I, I do have tanks in the main house. Um, so, for instance, my daughter's in, quite into it. She's got a little fish tank in her room, which is great. I'm happy to encourage it. But oh, every sure. time I need to go and change the bloody water in that thing, I'm like, oh, it's nowhere near a tap. It's nowhere near a yep. drain. It's yep. just a proper, yeah. So it's, it is much it's even, nicer. Even out of process as well. Like, I'm sure you go into your room to do your, your water changes and, you know, this, then this, then this, and then and it just, it's a process and it's a routine. Yeah. Something that's completely off the routine is just, it changes everything. Yeah, I mean, and it is that locality to water <laughs> sounds like you're we're some kind of pioneers here but if it's not <laughs> a water source or a way to get water out of it it just becomes so much more hard so yeah. in here it's literally put a hose in and drain it and then I put another hose in and fill it I don't have to faff around with chemicals or aging water or any of that stuff it's just out back in done next one yep yeah makes sense uh, do you have various different sorts of filtration running through all your aquariums, or you're pretty pretty strong on one only, or how's all the, the hardware? I've got a mix. The um, so I have a central-ish air going around. Uh, so almost all tanks have air going to them, but some tanks have other things in them as well. So this tank, for instance, has a canister filter. A couple of the other ones have hang-on backs because I've been testing them and just thought, oh, yeah, it kind of works, I'll leave it there, and that's fine. But yeah. the basis is air for everything. So I've got sponge filters on almost every tank mm -hmm. um, with maybe a couple of internals, a couple of hang-on backs, and one canister now. And the sump for the big tank, I suppose. That's slightly different. Yeah, yeah. Any, any preference on filtration style or is just kind of what's convenient for you at the time? Um, if I could if I could make it work everywhere, it would be sump everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's my preference. Gets things out of the main tank, gets your water volume up, um, gives you way more options yeah. for lots of media to go in your sump. I mean, it's not necessary, but it's... If I can make it work, I would make it work. It's a little bit of a fish keeping flex that you've got 5,000 kilos of XYZ media. Yeah, and, and it does prove handy every now and again. So if I do want to set up a tank, I can grab a bag of media out of the sump from one tank and say, that's good to go. That tank's ready. Yeah. Um, yep. The same with, I have some tanks that have multiple air uh, sponge filters in them because I know I can then take that out and use that to instantly start another tank without having to worry about it. So mm. preference would be sump, then probably sponge filters, just because there's simplicity. There's not that much that can go wrong with them. They don't cost a lot. They don't cost a lot to run. They're not the nicest to look at, I suppose, might be the only drawback. Um, yeah. 
I was a big fan of canister filters for a long time. I was a big fan of the flu valve range. Um, but I'm not precious about them. I don't yeah. think they're any better than any other ones. Um, and canisters are fine if that's what works. Yeah, I think uh, regardless of which filtration method you choose to use, they mm -hmm. all have their ups, they all have their downs, and they all have their pitfalls. Like, there's, there's yeah. no perfect system, much like there's no perfect fish food. Whatever works for you the best is probably the one that you should be happy with and, and, and roll with that. Yeah, so this tank here is drilled for a sump, but doesn't have a sump on it. It has a canister filter on it because somebody gave me a canister filter. So yeah. <laughs> that's the only reason that's the best one for that tank. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I personally, I really don't like sponge filters, but it's pretty hard to run a full fish room of 100 or so tanks without them. They just It just makes sense to roll down that, that route when it comes to that, but it's just the one that works the best for the situation. Yeah. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with sponges. Uh, you're probably yeah. the same reasons where you think they're great and they're doing the things, and then as soon as you touch them, they go and explode. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh, God's sake. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons yeah. I prefer yeah. canisters, because internal filters, even certain hang-on backs, when you restart them after... Making a mess of everything. It's that boom <laughs> effect that spoils all your hard work. Yeah, yeah there's a lot to be said for, like, yeah canister filters that you can just shut off the valves take it away somewhere else and clean it and plug it yeah. back in again. Or the Oasi ones where you just pull out the pre-filter. Yeah. So much easier. Mm. But yeah, convenient. Definitely. As a Scotsman living in Yorkshire, who I'm reliably told are the two tightest people in the universe, yeah. free is always what gets me going. Yeah. <laughs> oh I yeah. Favourite word in the world. Um, have you got any advice to anyone that's looking at or considering setting up a fish room if you were to start again? How how would you build that from ground up? Uh, yeah, don't. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it's one of those things where I don't think it's for most people. Why, why do you need a fish room? There's, there's got to be something wrong with you if you need a fish room. If you really, really want a fish room, then that that's why you should have a fish room. Um, the amount of people over the years I've seen come and go, whether they be YouTube personalities or just people that you see in the hobby, you can almost set an alarm to it where it's, I've got a fish room, I'm setting up a fish room, advice to build the fish room. 18 months later, I'm breaking down my fish room. Who wants to buy all these tanks? Yeah. Can I get rid of it again? So it's not for the faint-hearted. It's a big commitment. You're taking up a big space with lots of things. It's just weird for most people. You don't need that. If, if you're really into breeding, it might work. If you're really into seeing lots of different species and having to keep them all at once and you can't delay your gratification like what I can't, then it might be for you. But for the normal person, I just don't think it's right. But I would start up by planning what is the worst that can happen? So disaster planning is step one for me. If everything bursts and leaks, where's the water going to go? Because mm -hmm. even a small fish room has a lot of water in it and water can damage things very quickly, as I have come to learn over my years of ineptitude. And it can go pretty much anywhere it wants to go. It'll go where you don't want it to go, <laughs> nine times out of ten. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So... That's why I quite like a garage, because I don't know if it's the same over the rest of the world, but they tend to be built on a slight slope to go away from the house, if it's under a house, for instance. So I know that if anything leaks in here, as it often does, it's just going to go straight out there, and that's fine. I'm happy with that. Once I've sorted out the disaster planning, it's more about space and space for equipment so where's my stuff going to go the tanks are usually one of the last things to go so i want to know where is my drain point where is my water point where's my electric points and then once i know all that and get all that in place it's then it's right i'm having racks of tanks am i building my own racks am i having individual big tanks small tanks whatever that's the fun bit really once you've got all the basics sorted i think the rest of it kind of falls into place mm -hmm. Yeah, but, yeah just, but just don't do it. 
unless you unless you really really want to. Yeah, it's definitely not something that I could achieve. I mean, the first time I walked into a fish room, uh, it was Julian Dignall's the Planet Catfish. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. I walked into his fish room and the noise was deafening because it's, it's long and narrow, um, and it was unbelievable. I mean, you've been in lots of old fish rooms and things like that, like fish shops. You've got the bubbles and everything, but this just blew me away that you could have this in his house. And I walked out thinking, I want that. But then I walked into somebody's shed and I seen the less refined version of a fish room. And it, that was probably going to be my reality. And then that was my dream crushed at that point because I thought, I'm never going to be able to keep it the way I want it, so I'm not even going to attempt it. And, and one of the things I noticed as well, as someone who has a fish room, it's always in a complete state of disarray. So any little bit of a project or thing that I want to do, it seems like I turn my back for two seconds and gremlins come out and just go, ha ha, I'm going to throw everything <laughs> everywhere. And I'm like, where did this come from? I can't stand on it. But the noise is definitely something that's... I, I operated for years thinking that air pumps only came in XX li XXL with the L standing for loud. <laughs> it wasn't until I got one of these, the one that I'm running now is practically silent in comparison, but I had years of just a, a drone of eh, and I thought, <laughs> I guess I have to put up with this. Um, but yeah, improvements can be made in that kind of thing. The biggest issue I've got at the moment is I'm also using this as my office, which during the winter is great because I'm heating this room. So it's nice and warm in here, but it it's also always 25 degrees in here. And I, I'm wearing a jumper now going, this was a mistake. <laughs> it's, it's way too hot in here to be wearing a jumper. So I'm perpetually yeah. a bit like, whew, it's a bit oh, warm in here. This is bright red. And, yes. and that must be why the Friday beer comes into play. Yes. Yeah. It does help. Yeah. I have a big fridge there as well with lots of cold drinks in it. And, and now that I've mentioned that, I'm going to have to take my jumper off. Yeah, go, go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's fun having a fish room, I must say, but it's a, a bit of a commitment, I guess. Is. Yeah. So you're, you're heating your ear, not heating your aquariums, is what I'm yeah. hearing from you? Yeah. yeah. So I do have heaters in some aquariums, just as a backup and have heaters in the ones I want to be a bit warmer than 25, like the discus tank, I want that to be about 28. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have a heater in that one, but the rest of them are just running off the heat of the room. Um, I very much agree with you when you're basically saying the green ones come out. And it doesn't matter how often you, you tidy your fish room and you say to yourself, I'm never going to let this happen again. Yeah. Three days later, it's happened again and you're tidying up again and go, I'm never going to do this again. I'm going to put stuff back. doesn't matter what the intentions are. It just, they, it just happens like that. Every now and again, I'll go around and I'll like, I'll make a plan and I'll say, I'm going to put one of those big metal hooks up there and I can hang things mm -hmm. on that hook. And it's full. I've hung many things on the hook, but there's still crap all over the floor. And I'm like, where did yeah. this all come from? This does, yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, yeah, I, went, I went upstairs earlier to sort dinner out for the kids and came back in here for this and looked at the floor and went, right, someone's messing with me. Someone's come down here and tossed everything all over the floor. It just uh, gremlins. Yeah. It's because you've got shiny things to distract yourself with every time. So, like, you just put a container of food down and I'm yeah. going to put it back where it lives. But, oh, look, wow, what are they doing? And then you hand and you just walk away from it. Yeah, I've got, like, um, algae scrapers. I think I must own about 300 of them. But I can only ever find one at a time, and then I lose that immediately. Yeah, um, all that kind of stuff. It just it's in my nature to be messy as well, as I'm sure my wife would tell you if she was here. But it doesn't help when it's got all the gremlins helping you be messy. <laughs> um, how do you balance the aesthetics and functioning aspects of your aquarium setups, and how much of of your YouTube stuff comes into play with with that as well? Um, I have a bit of a mix, and I think I'm in the middle of a transition period of going from having more bare tanks to more feature tanks. And while it will help YouTube, I guess, because it'll be content where I can say I'm changing this tank and I'm building this tank and I'm microscaping that tank mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, it's more because I think I'm changing from 
I spend a lot of time in here. I spend every day in here working. When I turn around, I don't want to look at a bear tank. I've decided I want to look at something a bit nicer than that. Um, so well, and it was this tank that did it for me. I used to have my flower horn in here where it was a an empty tank, but a really, really bright fish. Mm -hmm. And I was fine with that. But now that I've done this and scaped it a bit and I have my nice discus in it, it looks so much nicer to me where I turn around and go, oh, yeah, that does make me feel a little bit better. Um, so I would just want more of that. It's not because I want to film it, but I will. <laughs> but you've still got to enjoy the fish tanks that you've got because yeah. they're not commercial. So it's not like you're, you're needing that clean bare bottom tanks for efficiency. You want to still enjoy them as a fish keeper. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I want to do is have I have a rack down the side here where I think if I am ever going to do breeding projects again, I might just keep them out of the way and that can be mm -hmm. the breeding area and then the rest of it can be the nice area and just oh. do that. I think I'm getting to the stage now where, not that I've come to terms with it or anything, but I used to always think in terms of what's the next fish I'm going to get. Yeah. where I'm not that bothered about that now. I'm kind of, what's the next tank I can complete? And I don't think I ever thought about fish tanks in that way that they could be done, because they never are done. There's always work that needs to be done on them, but this tank is done. I'm not going to rescape it majorly. I'm not going to add lots of new fish or change it completely. It's going to look a version of this. Mm -hmm. And then I want to move on to the next one and say, this is a slightly different take on it, but it's kind of done. I like to liken them as um, working aquariums to not working aquariums, so to speak. Hmm. Um, I don't care if it's a bit murky. I don't care if it doesn't look pretty. There's algae all over it. As long as the water parameters are good for the fish that they're in and they're, they're doing good, it doesn't worry me compared to the ones where you're wanting to make sure they're looking sparkly and prim and proper on, on a regular basis. They're kind of two different ways of, of having them, so to speak. Yeah, I think that that's probably a better way of explaining what I was meaning. Because um, there are tanks that do jobs. They are, yeah. whether it's quarantine tanks, whether it's breeding tanks, or you're, it's not there to be pretty, it's there to do a thing. And then I've got the ones that is there to be pretty, and I want them, that's their job, to be pretty. And, yeah make me relax <laughs> well i tell you story, I, I stopped off um in a pets at home today to pick up some things for my daughter's gecko and they've recently changed all their aquarium setups so now instead of having that black gravel which was fine what they've now got is bare bottom tanks but with the image of gravel so it's like oh. a, a, an aquarium back you know the backdrop but on the base so it looks like gravel but it's not and what, what makes it really suck is they've went with really rubbish rainbow gravel oh lovely clown puke yeah it's funny, funny you say that i was just about to say i really don't care what the tank looks like for a working aquarium as long as it doesn't have rainbow gravel on it i'm okay <laughs> i mean it's not like multicolor, yeah. but it's blue and red and it's, it's just i don't get it yeah i mean i get the fact that in a shop for instance mm. it's an extra job if your tank has a substrate to clean that tank especially when you're trying to cycle through lots of deliveries and things like that yeah a bare bottom tank can be stripped cleaned and put repurposed fairly quickly where one that's scaped nicely and has a substrate and all that is a little bit more of a challenge so i kind of get that but the clown flute gravel oh. I know. why would you go for that um i'll just just like to caveat that a little bit if it's your aquarium and your house and you like the rainbow gravel then that's all good as long as you're enjoying it that's the main thing it's just definitely not for me and clearly not for you guys either yeah i'd like to con counter that caveat by saying no you're wrong change it <laughs> just straight wrong <laughs> it should be banned <laughs> no, it, it broke my heart to uh, when I said my daughter has a, a fish tank we went around to one of the fish shops and she was looking at the gravel and there was this luminous neon pink gravel and she's going dad 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 and I'm going can't hear you <laughs> but she now has luminous pink gravel in the bottom oh. of her aquarium does it, does but like you say happy? if she's happy then I'm yep. happy what fish yeah, and, and 
Sorry? What kind of fish does she have? Uh, just some guppies at the moment. Right. And if Clan Gravel is the way that she gets into the hobby for life, then who are we to judge on that? Yeah. So sort of Exactly. Uh, so, gateway Gravel. Gateway Gravel. It's a gateway Gravel. That's gateway it. Gravel. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is light at the end of the tunnel because she, she came down to see the last tank that I built. It's only a little tiny nano tank but had live plants in it and stuff like that and she came very much oh that's nice dad i was like yes got her yeah. <laughs> uh, we've had another question from the chat a little bit earlier on uh because you mentioned flower horn was a, a little while ago so big fish first is small fish what do you find to be the best well i think i'm going to be mr. Fence, mr fence sitter and say they both have their own values. I'm a, I'm a big fan of big fish, and I'm a big fan of little fish. I've, I've obviously got my big giant snake heads and giant grammies and things like that, and they're all love them to bits. But I'm just as happy with a tank full of guppies watching them do their thing. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, what's been your most memorable moment in fish keeping so far? Oh. Does it have to be a positive one or a negative one? <laughs> no, no, just, just memorable, that's all. Uh, the, the most memorable, there's two contenders for this one, so apologies to anyone who's heard this story, but it was going away for Christmas with the family and young kids to come back down here on Christmas Day. And when we came back on Christmas Day, my big discus tank had burst and leaked all over the living room. And the living room was on the middle floor of the house. So it leaked through the wall and killed the electrics. And all the Christmas dinner was gone. And Christmas was ruined. I was bad Santa that year. <laughs> that was quite a difficult one to come back from. So it ruined the floors. It ruined the walls. It killed all my favorite fish. It killed our Christmas dinner. Christmas. Um, yeah, so that one was quite hard to come back from. And then more recently again because i'm in the garage there's a soil pipe that runs up there from one of the toilets upstairs which got blocked and i went to investigate and it exploded all over me and all over all the tanks and the on the racks so i had what we christened the poonami um in the fish room which was again Thankfully, most of the tanks weren't running at the time because I was fairly new to the house and had not got everything set up. But, oh God, even talking about it now is making me get a little bit. It's, it's one of those situations you don't want to remember. So they're my two most memorable because I can't forget about them. Yeah, uh, that doesn't sound that pleasant. <laughs> not something I think I'd like to experience. No, no. It was whatever the opposite of fun is. That's what that was. <laughs> not fun? <laughs> yeah, very, very not fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually almost think I'd prefer the Christmas issue over the other <laughs> issue. To be honest. Yeah, well, with the Christmas issue, everyone was pissed off at me. With the Punami incident, uh, it was only me that got upset. Because in theory, I did clear the blockage. Yeah, so they were happy. Yeah, so everyone else was happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. How do you keep yourself informed and continuously learning about fish keeping? I I have a Rebecca. <laughs> um, so I know you've had Rebecca on your channel to interview her, so she pops up in my live streams quite a lot and is on my Discord server and all that kind of stuff. So whenever I need to be kept right, I ask her questions and she tells me things. Yeah, I have also bounced questions off her more than once um, for the, very much the same reason. Uh, I think I might have been in one of your live streams maybe a week or two ago and I think your exact comment or similar comment was anyone can enter except for Rebecca or something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're wrong, Rebecca will be the, the, the question master, so, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I found that quite amusing. We we do a quiz on my live stream on a Friday night, and if Rebecca doesn't get to have the fish as her, her avatar, she goes in a huff and doesn't want to play anymore. So that's <laughs> like one of the rules is you're not allowed to choose the fish when you play the quiz. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I tend to, I mean, I joke about that and we take the piss out of Rebecca quite a lot for her immense knowledge about all things ichthyology and zero knowledge mm. about anything post or pre-2001. Um, so she's never seen Die Hard. Can you believe that? What? Yeah. And and no refuses way. to watch it. What? Um, what? <laughs> so that's why there's quite often questions about Die Hard in some of my quizzes. Because <laughs> <laughs> she always gets the fishy ones. But, I mean, I think like anyone else, I'm all over all the Facebook groups. I follow all the the goings on. I used to get the magazines like PFK and things like that, but I, ha I just haven't for a long time. I tend to just see what's going on, and it's a bit of a privilege to have an audience because if I say something, and it really so that's kind of how I, I learn a lot of things is by saying something that's a mistake and being corrected. Um, mm -hmm. What was the, the recent one? Oh, it was about Corydoras and how they, they don't need soft substrate in a fish tank. It's all, all to do with that aquarium co-op video years ago where he went and he found some on some sharp substrate. And at the time, that was to me like, oh, right, okay, and kind of took it like that. But apparently there was a whole backlash to that saying, no, no, that was just one rogue fish found in a bit with some sharp gravel in it. They do need soft substrate. So again, I said, oh, well, there's that thing about Corey's not really needing soft substrate. And I was very quickly put in my place. Wow. I, think, I, um, I think a rare thing on the internet where I don't mind being corrected, <laughs> whereas most people will just fight the case constantly. I'm like, all oh, right, okay, got that wrong. Sorry. I think if, if somebody's correcting you and they're coming across respectfully and they're not being condescending, like, Better place, tang place, those kind of people. It can be, it's a good thing. You know, every day's a school day, and when you're putting yourself out on the internet, you've got to be prepared to receive feedback, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. I think you, you do. So, obviously, I get a lot of comments on the videos that I make, and anyone who makes internet content will get comments. People crawl out from under rocks all the time. Yep. I try not to just ignore it, so I ignore the sentiments. So if someone's going, you bleep, 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 idiot, that's wrong. I'll I'll try and take the, oh, okay, that was wrong, and ignore the expletives part of it. And I think that's how I find most of the things that I've, I've made mistakes about. Whereas if I was just blocking them and saying, no, I'm not going to listen to you, I, would, I might miss something that's valuable. Just because someone else is a dick doesn't mean I have to be a dick. Yeah. Hmm. There's also a lot to be said about delivery, and it's really hard to take context on stuff with black writing on white page compared to conversing yeah. with voice and getting all those cues. And sometimes people aren't actually coming across as a real dick. It's just how that's been formulated in written text on, on a screen. Yeah, and I, I've probably been guilty of the same thing where I've tried thinking I'm saying something that's just oh, here's a statement, whereas if I read it in the other person's voice, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll take that. Which is why I try not to immediately jump on the, oh, it's just a troll, ignore. There are trolls out there, um, but even trolls say the right twice, what, like a broken clock, the right every now and again. Um, but yeah, I had one the other day that was, what was it, a comment? It's the ones that are funny that get me, where I had one where they commented on one of the videos saying, Every, everything else was, oh, that's an interesting subject. Oh, have you tried this? Oh, what about you could do this, that, or the other? And this one was terrible title. That was, what, is that, that, that it? <laughs> <laughs> is that it? What? So, oh, okay, thanks. It's like a terrible title. I mean, all that's going to achieve is to get people to click on it and watch your video. And I was like, that means it's a brilliant title. What <laughs> planet are you on? So every now and again, you'll get the funny ones. Um, but, hey, engagement's engagement. I don't care if they're a troll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, um, I I love reading reviews that people have put a little bit of time into, and they've really become a bit of a wordsmith with it. Like it brightens my day a little bit that someone's put some time into thinking what they're trying to say, as opposed to just a straight up good or rubbish. Yeah. And like read it, start smiling. This is awesome, great, and and it's a similar thing when it comes to comments and, and chat sections and that kind of stuff. When someone's really put a little bit of thought into it. 
and really elaborated and enjoyed being a wordsmith, I, I tend to enjoy that a lot more as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I get that. That, that would be yeah. good. Yeah. Few and far between on my videos. It's mostly you're an idiot. <laughs> do you do you play off that somewhat? Um, I used to. I, yeah, I, I tried to. I don't, there's not enough hours in the day, if I'm completely honest. I, yeah. I run out of time to get upset about things most of these days. Yeah. I, I courted it maybe a few years ago where um, if there was a controversy, I wait, might play along. And But yeah, I just can't be bothered anymore. I'm too old and too tired. This can't be done. No, I had a bit of... No time for drama anymore. I had my I had my share of drama, and I'm finished with it. I had a, I had a bit of a public falling out with the king of DIY many moons ago. Mm-hmm. And I, while it was fun, didn't no good things come from it. So there's no point in it. And yeah. it got to the point where anything that's any disagreement that's had on the internet is very polarizing. There's no nuance to it. It's yeah, bad guy, good guy. And I don't hate the King of DIY, and I don't think I ever did hate the King of DIY, but that's how it's portrayed of. He hates him, and he hates him. I mean, we spoke several times, and nobody hates anybody. It's nuances lost on the internet, so, like I say, not enough time in the day for it. There you go, that's Rebecca. That's how she found me. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. And also, while we're here, Brian says you also called him an idiot in the backhanded way on Friday. Just for some fun. Backhanded way or nicely? <laughs> I, I didn't mean that you were an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, try, I try not to insult my viewers at the best of times, but, you know, Brian makes it hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was quite backhanded, and I like it. Um, is there any fish species or projects that you haven't worked on yet, but you're planning on in the future? Obviously, you discussed the potential what? with the rack behind you. Yeah. What's on your notepad? Uh, what's on my notepad? So, I think the oldest thing on my notepad has been African cichlids. I've never Don't done. Do I've never done it. I've always been scared to do it because it feels a little bit discusy. When I was first getting into discus, everyone was an expert. None of them agreed with each other, and I just couldn't see a clear path of what was a good thing to do. So I like the idea of doing it at some point, but again, it's one of those projects that keeps getting pushed down the list of mm-hmm. oh, there's always something else in front of it. And in terms of fish, I really want to try stingrays. I really want to try uh, some of the variants of the peacock bass in my mega tank. But again, I'm not really pushing it because as even though it is a big old tank, it is now getting quite full. So that might have to go on the back burner as well. Other than that, I'm kind of happy that I've got to try most things. I'm, I'm going on a bit of a, a planted tank shtick at the moment where (laughs) I bought a load of wholesale plants with the intention of doing what I was talking about starting to turn all these tanks into nice planted tanks Mm -hmm. and thinking I'll buy a load of load of plants and then I'll sell some of them and just whatever whatever I've got left I can use that to do the plants and sold them all so I need to do that again now so that plan didn't quite worked out quite well financially then that I sold them all but I haven't got enough left to make the tanks so that will be the next thing is learning more and but I've made many 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 aquascaping videos but they all go the same way of me standing in front of a tank throwing stuff in standing back and going uh, yeah yeah all right that works where I've started to try and learn from the people like George Farmer and your MD fish tanks of why does that look nice? And it's all the kind of same design principles for photography and things like that of there are some rules to why something is aesthetically pleasing and why something isn't. Mm. But I'm not very good at putting that into practice. Um, And I think it's because I don't spend a lot of time planning before I do it. I just 
this is what I've got. I'm going to throw it in that box and see if I can make it look as good as it can rather than spend a bit of time going, right, what I really need is three large things going that way and one small thing going that way and then this plant and that plant. So that's what I'm going to be concentrating on probably first because I think mm -hmm. that's the job that I need to do is to make all these look nice. Um, yeah. And then we'll, we'll worry about the next stuff after that. Cool. I find if I try and plan too far ahead in the future, I just get myself into a world of depression because I run out of time to do any of them and I have a big list of things that I haven't done and I go, oh, this is no use. Yeah, it's a, I'm sure it's a common trait through fish keepers or fish keeping, having all these wanting to do projects and just never kind of achieving them. Um, so I don't think you're alone there. I think it's a very common one and it makes it worse when you write them down because you don't forget them and you see them over and over again so why well, haven't i done it, that i, should I was just thinking that. the reason i can't show you my book is because i've probably thrown it away in frustration because i don't mm. want to keep looking at the page that has all the things i haven't done on it <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah also unfortunately uh if when doing videos and stuff like that you're mentioning stuff as well there's also a, a timestamp public of when you said we're going to do things and not actually done things um i believe i was meant to set up my automatic water change system about five years ago but that's a different story for a different conversation. Yeah, no, I, I find myself, it's always, right, I'm going to do the thing. I'll just do a water change before I do the thing. And oh, I've yeah. noticed that that light's not working. So I'll just fix that and then I've run out of time to do the thing. Yeah. So very much yeah. the procrastinator. Yes, you do. Um, I see you've got your own your own website which you sell some products on predominantly um plants and fish food and a bit of merchandise is that yeah. a, a fish food that you've sort of developed through yourself um no is that kind I've of future planning or just a wee little side project it's very much a side project so i don't yeah. make much money through it but it is um a few two or three different suppliers of fish food that i have used where i've gone to them and said can i sell this and they've said yes so oh. the reason that i talk about oh i use hikari cichlid gold because they said no so <laughs> i can't sell that as my own product whereas there's a company in germany that makes the um soft artemia pellet things which i really really love so yep got to deal with them when i can sell that and various other ones to sell some of the other foods so there are other products other brands white label products really rebranded mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the the plants again they're just a wholesaler from the netherlands that said yeah we'll happily give us the money and we'll send you the plants so yeah fine yeah. um the merch is one of my subscribers a guy called phil who runs a print shop so he said do you mind if I run your prints, uh, run your merch for you? So you can buy t-shirts like this with this oh, sucks with the pleco on it um, or all that kind of stuff. And he just prints them to order for me. Cool. Although I'm 99% sure that most of the people watching now will be absolutely aware of where they can buy that. Would you like to give yourself a plug right now to tell people where they can get that from? You can have a look on aquariumadventures.co.uk. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, how do you find your social media platform sort of works with having that website? Is it is it a driver for that, or is it, it just a really it a be. Yeah, I need a John. I am. I've, <laughs> I've got no time to do social media properly. Oh, um, yeah. I've got every now and again. I'll go on. I start going, right, I will do Instagram. I must do Instagram properly. I've got lots of pretty fish I can take pictures of and then I can never get never get the time, never get into it. I miss messages constantly. I'm just I'm, I'm the world's worst person when it comes to that side of it. I'm very much I'm on YouTube, I'm making videos, I'll try and read all the comments. I've even got my own Discord server and I miss messages on that as well. So I'll get messages from somebody offered me some fish the other day. I went, Oh, that's brilliant. I got, and I realized the message was from three months ago. I was like, Oh, right. <laughs> it's not going to probably still have them. Um, so I'm also really, well, I don't know if this is unusual or not, but 
I think I'm quite introverted. I don't like to shout and scream about how wonderful I am and how great everything is and come and buy my stuff. It's very much that, well, I've got this if you want it. Uh, whereas that's not how to run an ad campaign, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I know I should do more self-promotion. I keep making myself these New Year's lists where I keep saying things like, yeah, I'm going to post more often and try and boost sales or I'm going to go and visit more people or visit more shops and do face-to-faces with other YouTubers and creators, and then I never do. Yeah, It's easier planning than it is doing. Well, I can't even plan it. That's the thing. I'm <laughs> terrible at it. If somebody would just say, like, this is my ideal scenario. Somebody says, Graham, do you want to come on my live stream at 7 o'clock on this date? I can go, yeah, done. And I don't have to think about it again until 6.30 on that date. Uh, which, Cam, you'll probably know, I only today <laughs> saw the message from you saying, can you send me a picture for the thumbnail? And I went, oh, yeah, of course I can. And then I went, oh, that was from three days ago or something like that. <laughs> so, I made it work. <laughs> yeah, we got there in the end. But uh, yeah. I, I am, I don't want to sound like the martyr because I'm in a very privileged position that I can make videos and have a bit of a community going and all that kind of stuff. But I have a full-time job. It is fairly demanding I've got three kids who are very demanding and I've got all the other things so there are there are only so many hours left in the day mm. yeah. well, I, I do note that you didn't say you have a wife that is demanding just in case you saw it. <laughs> no no she's not demanding she's very helpful yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to let you know that Instagram sucks in general for keeping fish because it's really hard to take good photos of fish for Instagram, so you're not alone when it comes to that one. It is the platform that I find the hardest because it's hard to take a decent photo of a fish in an aquarium. It's just the maintaining it thing, and the majority of the the platforms require some level of consistency of doing. So I can manage it on YouTube. I can just about squeeze out a video every week. I can. The reason I love the live stream so much is because I can just say I'm booking myself 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. every Friday. I'm doing the live stream. There's no prep, as yeah. everyone who comes to my live streams knows. Quite often I turn up at five past nine going, uh, right, we're here. Uh, oh, can you hear me? No. Shit. Uh, yeah. So it's just that's an hour, uh, two hours that I can just sit and do and we have a bit of a laugh and that's that's that done. I can just about squeeze out the video. I can't do scheduled posts every three days on Instagram, on Facebook. I've got a Facebook group. I forgot I had a Facebook group. There's like two and a half Ooh. thousand people in my Facebook group and I've not seen it for the last year. That's not good. <laughs> I should I should do something about that. But yeah, there's just not enough hours in the day. Every yeah. single thing that you are saying resonates very strongly with me. Even with a John, we still <laughs> struggle to make all these things happen. It's 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 you're not alone. It's not just a you problem. It's a, it's a real thing for people that get involved in it. It is, yeah. and if you're not going to be consistent, I think it's almost it's a self fulfilling prophecy that if you know you can't be consistent, you may as well just not bother. And that's what I've done because why bother? And then it yeah. pisses people off because they say, "Well, I followed you on Facebook, like what you asked that time three years ago, and you've not done anything." Yeah. I, the same with the. YouTube memberships. Turn that on. Well, yeah, well, I will. I'll do like members only posts and I'll do extra content. I've never done that. And I, I apologize almost every week to everyone on my live stream saying, thank you for joining as a member. And I'm sorry I haven't given you anything for it. But no, you've paid for these lights to be on for an extra hour. So thank you. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you what other platforms are you on, but I almost feel like I don't want to ask you that now. Unless well, you want to share what you may or may not be? I'm I'm on them all. I'm just not very good on any of them. <laughs> if you want to if you want to get in touch with me, the Discord server is probably the one that I'm most active on because it's generally on my screen here most mm -hmm. of the time. Um and I, I'm only doing that because I, I think I've got one in me and I can manage that one because I've got some good people helping me do that. 
and I don't want to turn into like a, a 1990s Facebook group where everyone's just at each other's throat all the time. So I'm just trying to cultivate something that's a little bit more free and easy going. Yeah. I've got Twitter, I've got Instagram, I've got all these other ones. I just never use them. Not to say I won't one day, but I don't at the moment. Uh, while we're talking about that, I'd just like to say thank you to Rebecca for putting me in contact with you. Uh, because I was trying to get a hold of you and I couldn't work out how or where. <laughs> and I contacted Rebecca and she passed on your contact details. So thank you oh, very much for being on that. Much appreciated. Uh, without you, this wouldn't be happening today. Well, if anybody else out there ever wants to speak to me, graham at aquariumadventures.co.uk. That's my email. That's the thing that always gets through. Um, always, with maybe Ooh. a week's delay, <laughs> um, but almost always gets through. Yeah, sure. uh, can you share any particularly challenging questions or situations a viewer has brought to you and how you got through that? Well, the most challenging things I get is when, so I'm not very good at diagnosing illnesses and sickness in general. So I'm often mistaken for an expert because I put videos out on the internet. So I'm always, always trying to say, look, I'm just an idiot with a camera and a, a hobby. But people will turn up and demand, my fish has this behavior. What is it? And that's my number one pet hate of things, of people who diagnose things with one line of information. And then the vitriol or hatred for not diagnosing that thing from one line of information. I don't know how to deal with that the best way. So I usually just ignore it. <laughs> I, I can't think of any better way to do that. I used to try and create templates for, like, this is a, your minimum data set for if you have a problem with a tank, I want to know this. How big is the tank? How old is the tank? What's in the tank? How often do you do this? How often do you do that? Then send me that, and I might be able to help you. But no one's willing to do that. It's the old cliche of what are your water parameters? Fine. As much yeah. as that is true sometimes, they can be fine. I get that. But it doesn't help when you're trying to diagnose something and find is it's a range mm. so some things might happen more readily with more acidic water or harder versus softer or warmer versus colder so you can have ranges of fine within all that but it doesn't help me tell you what's wrong and then i'm also an idiot so at the best of times i'm not going to be able to tell you what's wrong with your fish so i'm just disappointing people from the get-go so that's my number one bugbear is not knowing how to diagnose fish illnesses, even when I do get the information. And it's the only way I can get through it is to be apologetic and say, sorry, join my Discord. Someone really clever will help you. <laughs> I find um, fish illness a really interesting, complex and tricky subject all in the same time, because it can present a little bit like this, but without the proper tools like a microscope to really work it out, you're kind of throwing shit against the wall sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes a broad diagnosis can work. Other times it won't. One person said, I had this and this fixed it. And someone goes, there's no way that product or chemical should have fixed that issue. It can't have been that. But XYZ told me it was that. So it's such a messy, muddy pool of what it could be without really diving down. And at the end of the day, the vast majority of us are all just hobbyists. And we're just yeah. trying out from a hobbyist standpoint and a hobbyist point of view. Yeah, I mean, I did have, um, in my early discus keeping days, I had um, the discus plague, as they were calling it at the time, where uh, it was suspected to be cross-contamination because I had been stupid and mixed things because I didn't know any better. And I ended up going to a vet who had some specialist knowledge. And I've never been asked questions like he asked me in any hobbyist setting. It wasn't what are your water parameters. It wasn't any of those things. He was interested in, right, I'm going to need a biopsy. I'm going to need this. You could tell me your fish is swimming erratically. That means nothing medically it, because there are a thousand reasons a fish could swim erratically. And unless you get every single bit of information, it, it's very difficult. And yeah. even when, <coughs> pardon me, when my flower horn was sick, I got microscopes, got everything, still couldn't tell. 
So <laughs> that's that's the the upsetting part about it is that even when you've got all the best equipment and you're trying your hardest and you still can't tell what's wrong and then it ties anyway. Mm. And like Rebecca's just brought up a really good a good point is that biopsies or even trips to the vet cost cost a lot of money. And, and they're so hard to find vets that deal with fish yeah. around here anyway. Yeah, add that as well. And like how many people are going to do that for a three dollar, four dollar tetra? Because it's only three or four dollars, and we put the, the money over the fish life compared to yeah. say like a, a couple hundred dollar flower horn, you'll be more likely to want to, to try and do that. But it's still a live animal, we should still be trying to do better. But it's it's such a, a tricky, tricky complex situation and subject that's yeah no real right or wrong answer for it so to speak yeah i think i totally agree it's just a dodgy area that i'm not qualified to be wading around in yeah yeah uh we will just change subject to a little bit lighter uh, we've got a question off the floor Death actually this might this might, this might yeah. not be a little bit lighter if you were in a shop and the wrong tank size or advice was being told would you step in Mm. No, not really like them. No, <laughs> no, I, uh, I have done in the past. I don't know if he's referring to a story I've told, but um, in general, no, because it's 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 very hard to be very wrong with things like that. How big a tank do I need? But if it's horrific advice and I'm in a fish shop, I'll often kind of go and try and call that person. And go. Uh, do you know when he said you wanted a 40 litre tank? I think he meant 200. Just, I'll leave you with that type of thing. Um, but I've not heard such terrible advice. I mean, even with the uh, like your pets at home or big box stores as they might be in the States or wherever else you are in the world, the people that work there, they tend to be good natured. They tend mm -hmm. to be people who are interested in it just because their company isn't the best at making posters. Like I don't know if you remember, John, the Pets at Home stuff that said, if you want a fish, buy a tank today, come back tomorrow for your fish. Yes, that, then, it, then it'll be cycled. Uh, and even the folk that work in Pets at Home were a bit like, we don't have a choice. We had to put that poster up. Yeah. We are telling people to ignore that. Um, but you get good people in bad shops, you get bad people in good shops, it's you just have to learn to take the good with the bad it's not worth the hassle to go up chasing people around shops to go, that's wrong, you're wrong, change your information um, I, I mean in general I think the the whole retail side of things is improving as a whole there seems to be I, so. home. I, mean, I don't buy fish for their but I've bought plants sometimes or I buy reptile stuff now and I do mm. notice that They've kind of eased off with the 20 questions that they used to put you through with the iPad and it's more of a natural conversation now and it genuinely seems that they're employing actual fish keepers to do the job. I, I think in general they are and yeah. quite often the, the problems I've seen there is it's when it's the cat food person that's covering lunch right. for the fish person and they don't know anything about fish so they've only got the script that they've been given to go <laughs> off. So mm. In those situations, I think the script should be better. But yeah. like you say, I think it is getting better. It is. The the other element to that, of course, is much like fish illness and the, and the medication stuff, a lot of it is on personal experience. And I have XYZ fish in a 40-litre aquarium for three years. It was fine. So it should be okay for everybody. The reality is it probably should have been a far larger one, but there's that we're hobbyists, it comes from pure experience and what has worked for me and what hasn't worked for me type of advice that comes through with stuff as well, rightly or wrongly. Yeah, I think you get a better experience if you're in a, a specialist. So if it is a local fish shop rather than a pet store, yeah. you're, going to, you're going to get a better chance of getting better stuff. But I've been in plenty of bad pets, fish shops where... You can tell they're struggling. They're not making any money. They just need to sell stuff, and they're going to do whatever they can do to make rent that month or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't know what pressures are going from all different angles on these people, so it's really hard to to judge them. But, yeah, your chances are higher in a, a specialist, I think, of getting better service. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I don't envy you, Cam. I know how much work that must go into running a fish shop. It's it's one of those things that everybody always asks me. Oh, I bet you'd love to have a your own shop, Graham, wouldn't you? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have no desire to work eighty hours a week. No, thank you. Uh, I understand. Yeah. Uh, what impact now or in the future do you hope that your your channel can have for the fish keeping community? Oh, there's a question. I don't know. Um, I've never really thought about it, to be honest. I've always come from the point of view of I'm the dumb guy pointing a camera at what he's doing rather than I'm an educator, I'm inspiring people. I'm uh, No. It's more on the entertainment side rather than anything else. So I hope I can show that fish keeping's cool, can be fun, looks good, can be both relaxing and incredibly stressful. <laughs> Just give you a little bit of a, a dip into what it's like to be a hobbyist with no self-control and 30 tanks rather than three. So aquariums yeah. uncovered, basically. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Confessions of an Aquarist. Oh, that's that's the title of my book, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that on your notepad? I'll, I'll put it, when I find my notepad, I'll put it on. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no grand aspirations. Um, I often joke that, yeah, YouTube is my retirement plan. Uh, that if I keep going, I'm bound to grow a bit and make a little bit of money out of it. But when you get people who are like, one of the most frustrating things is Rebecca, freshwater ichthyology. Why she isn't letting me edit her videos or putting out more videos with the wealth of knowledge that she's got there. Yeah. That's the kind of thing where I think YouTube is the perfect space for that. It's yeah. where anyone can share their knowledge. Anyone includes the idiots as well as the actual experts. So I'm, I'd, I'd love to use my platform if I have it to share more of the experts and the good people than anything else, because it's not going to come from me. I'm never going to have the time to become an expert. I might become experienced, but then I'll be one of those people I always moan about that says, just because you've been doing it a long time doesn't mean you're doing it right. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. There's an incredible amount of knowledge in Rebecca's head, and it's phenomenal when it just comes out. It's great. It's fantastic. Yeah, and it is. I know I'm picking on her because she comes to my live streams all the time, and I see her in my Discord, and she has helped me and given me advice and things like that. But there are others. I want mm. to. A, a lot of the. <clears throat> the YouTubers are a bit protective sometimes, I feel, where they're like, oh, that person knows more than me, so they must be put down. Whereas I'm like, no, <laughs> get front and centre. You should be the one telling people how to do things. Do you think, this is just coming up to my head, so I might not word it the way that I'm trying to ask it. Do you think that the people that have, a lot of the people that have got all of this really intense quality knowledge get slightly put off from the flashy, buy my stuff, look at my fancy stuff, wow, bright light type of YouTube and go, I don't want to be a part of that as opposed to I've got all of the stuff that the world can really benefit from or the fish keeping world can benefit from. Yeah, I think there probably is an element of that. I wouldn't like to second guess anyone as to that being the yeah. reason, but yeah. you have to have a level of shamelessness to make YouTube videos. Who, why would you want to watch me talk about a nitrogen cycle? The the gall, the absolute gall of me to think I can make a video and people will watch it, but they do. So mm. that's I think if you've spent a lot of time gathering all this knowledge and becoming an expert in something, that's a big leap to take to go mm. from being a respected professional, publishing papers, doing talks and all that kind of stuff to hi guys oh god it makes me sick just to think about me doing that kind of stuff so i can imagine what it's like for them but the yeah. thing is there is a lot of people on youtube that do serious videos and they do them in the, the format of like a lecture but obviously a bit friendlier than standing up you know pointing away um so i think it, it, it can you can deliver quality whilst 
main, you know, keeping it relatively entertaining as well without selling that, yourself. I think that's the thing about YouTube is that it is a platform that's so diverse. You can mm. have stupid vloggy stuff to uh, everyday life stuff to proper lectures and well-researched think papers and all, every every aspect has its thing but what i mean by the, my my frustrations with rebecca's channel and sorry to pick on you rebecca about this my frustrations with that is it's like on the brink of being more mainstream so if i had her brain in my head and my channel i think that would be the thing that would do a good thing for the hobby whereas because people will and youtube's terrible for this but it's the best videos i've ever made about me having some kind of disaster yeah. and because i'm a stupid idiot i have lots of disasters so therefore i have lots of decent videos and i get a bit of traction and things start to move and all that kind of stuff but at the end of the day i've got nothing to offer you it is just if you stay and you're hanging around you're staying because you don't mind me or you find me mildly interesting or mildly funny I'm, you're not here for my knowledge you shouldn't have to do all that but that is what happens. you have to make the virally videos or at least attempt every now and again to please the algorithm to get some kind of growth to build an audience and then once you've got your audience what are you going to do with it i'm not going to do anything with it i'm just going to keep building it very very slowly whereas someone like rebecca could be using that to then spread the word about everyone says psychos need to eat wood it's not true and rather than have a thousand people watch it have ten thousand people watch it Change you know the, the knowledge that rebecca's got she's got the capacity <coughs> to change the hobby but again mm. i'm putting a lot of this on her and i was using her as an example because i thought she might not want to it's, so it's not for me to say you should do this and oh you're frustrating me it's when i use her as an example i mean people like her yeah i know because the dry university style lecture on youtube the people that want that knowledge will seek it out the people that don't even know it exists will never come across it so we have to have something that bridges that gap okay. yeah so we i think this is we're approaching having 50 guests on now 48 47 something on those marks and we've had some incredibly intelligent people and knowledgeable human beings on on our show and we've talked to and often I'll get off it and, and I feel absolutely enlightened and oh, wow, this was phenomenal and I feel inspired and, and knowledge has come through. And then like I question why these people aren't aren't getting more people watching it and having that change in those mindsets. And it purely has to be the in my mind, the the lack thereof, the clicky clicky, you gotta be buying my stuff sort of stuff because as far as a hobby goes, I think we need more people like that coming through, promoting it yeah. from a real knowledge base, not a <clears throat> well, I this base, give it a click base sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The majority of channels out there are doing fish stuff. They're repeating the same stuff over and over again that everyone else is repeating. And it's not that these people have studied this. They've just watched someone else say it and they're repeating it. And I probably do that as well. Like the whole six discus to a tank thing. I haven't gone out and done any research to prove whether that is the optimal number or not. I'm just repeating what someone told me once and happens to work for me. It's yeah. it's a very tricky thing to try and work out what the difference is between an entertainment channel and an education channel. For sure. Yeah. Alexander combines mm. both very well. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's very good at what he does as well. Um, he's got that thing of just he pumps it out, so he's got yeah. that that work ethic as well. Um, but again, he, he's not. They're not hugely polished videos. They're not. No. Um, you, you, I, I'm not having a go at them, but it, it no, is. No, no, you sacrifice <laughs> high quality cameras and, and production for the information that's coming through those videos what i like about yeah. his videos is i see a bit of my videos in them whereas i'm pointing my camera at me 
doing a bit of filtration tinkering. He's pointing at his camera going, I've just remembered this thing that's really interesting, so I'm going to tell you about it. And it's that kind of style that's really good. Yeah, it's, mm. it's almost like you're stepping in to that person's fish <laughs> tank. Or you've popped round to your friend's house and you're both sat in front of the, the fish tank and you're chatting about fish. Yeah. That's what I like. That's, And I think for a lot of people that follow yourself, Graham, is they get that vibe of they're enjoying your hobby with you. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's, that's about the best I can offer. <laughs> yeah, and I think for a lot of people that they don't have access to other local fish keepers' aquariums, and so they do seek that out online. And then for somebody like yourself who's not trying to sell punt, sell gimmick, high end aquascapes, and you are a hobbyist, and and that comes through the screen. So that that's your value. I mean that that's what I find appealing. And that's I'm about to move into high end aquascaping now. <laughs> 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 no, not really. <laughs> so I, I find it very difficult to accept any praise for doing a good job on YouTube because I don't think I I don't work particularly hard at it. I'm just consistent. Mm -hmm. I try and stick to my special sauce of film what you do every now and again, throw in a bit of a funny one. Yeah. And enjoy it on the way through. Yeah, because if I don't enjoy it, I'm not going to do it. So I don't need to. 100%. So. 100%. Yeah. I really start to look forward to my Friday nights now because I get to hang out with other weirdos like me. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun. As long as it's fun, I'm going to keep doing it. The best thing I like about your Friday nights is at times about the time that I've just left work for the morning. So I get to go home and have a have a piece of toast and a, and a cup of coffee and you're on doing your live. So I get to watch that between the ruckus of being at work and the ruckus of dealing with my family. There's this little period of time that I can just sit and <laughs> have other fish stuff being put in my face. Where I I'm sit and job. shout at websites for not working properly or why is my camera not? <laughs> Focus, you damn... <laughs> So do you go live every Friday at nine o'clock then? Yeah. UK time, obviously. Yeah. Yep. I think we're on week number 155 or something. Wow. Well, I've not missed many, so I'm trying to keep it going. Do you, um, do you feel the pressure of having to, not so much the pressure of having to do it at that time, but when you potentially can't make it, do you feel like you've let people down and, and the pressure of that part of it? I probably, I would, yeah, I think I would if I thought about it for too long. I quite often forget it's Friday, so I'll have someone send me a message going, Graham, you've not sent out the, your, you've not set up your live stream yet, and it's five o'clock. I'll be like, yeah, that's tomorrow. I'll go, no, it's Friday today. Oh, shit. And I have to go and do it. So that's happened a few times, but I've, I've managed to make it most weeks. But So there's one in May coming up, and we're going away on holiday, so I won't be doing that one. And it did cross my mind. I was like, oh, that's a shame. I thought, no, it's not. I'm going on holiday. That'll be fine. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We had a situation a little while ago. I went on a we fish trip up north and it just timed about exactly the same time that we had to do one of the live streams. So John ran it for me. I just quickly basically phoned in just to make sure we had one going on. But there was that, oh, we've timed this wrong. How are we going to make that work sort of scenario? So, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, it, it's not my job, but it's not TV, it's not anything else. It's it's a bit of fun, and as long as as long as everyone shows up, I'll keep doing it. But I, I can't say fairer than that that it's it's enjoyable for me. It must be enjoyable for some people a little bit. I am. I want to make it better because so often I turn up on a Friday night with no idea what I'm going to talk about. So I rely on people asking questions or bringing up topics. Mm. And the only thing I usually plan is the quiz where, again, on my notepad, wherever it is, I have some ideas of things that we can start to introduce as regular features for the Friday Night Live. But I've never really been stuck for something to talk about. So that's the beauty of the audience are really good for that. They're, mm -hmm. they're there saying, oh, have you seen this has happened this week? Or what is, what's your take on this? Or such and such has done this to you like that. And then I, I can go off on tangents all night long. That's fine. I've, I've started doing some lives on TikTok. Um, 
and I just go live and sat in front of the aquarium and the, the questions that come through on the live chat does it just send you off on a tangent or somebody will ask a question about a specific fish they've seen and you start talking about that and then that opens up other questions and it, is, it, is, it kind of just takes care of itself and it's, it's not even just fish on mine so I've probably got the least fishy fishy live stream in the whole of YouTube because we spend an awful lot of time talking about Jean Claude Van Damme or Die Hard or the the merits of sixties heavy metal versus eighties rap and things like that. I think we had one week, so it it does it's proper tangents and hopefully it gives a little bit of a break from just the and the neon tetra needs this requirement to be happy. That's for a video. This is it's more about you're at the pub together or you're just having a laugh with your friends. I heard a wee rumour that Rebecca wants you to start all your live streams with a fact about Die Hard every week. Just <laughs> from what I've heard. Well, I, I I think we did one quiz almost exclusively about Die Hard questions just to force her <laughs> to watch it and she still didn't watch it. <laughs> and she still won. I had to send her a bloody light for a prize. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Um, have you experimented with different tank setups or themes? Um, you know, do you have a particular style that you like, or what? You know, when it comes to aquariums, what's your favourite sort of thing? Um, I've, I've experimented a little bit, I guess. My my favourite kind of setup is what I call bog standard planted. So it's a little bit of hardscape, a little bit of plants, and let them grow up. Um, I've experimented with we did a a subscriber tank for a link to the live screen where we picked the, our favorite fish, picked our favorite tank type, picked our favorite fish, and picked all the various bits and ended up with, I think it was a, an African biotope that I had to build. And then I went away and did that as a project. So that was quite fun. And we might do another one of them quite soon. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't have any specific standards or anything. I'm quite happy to give everything a shot. And I've, yeah. I've probably tried most things, but I'm quite low maintenance. So whatever's easiest. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Makes <laughs> absolute sense. Uh, how do you approach the topic of sustainability in your fish keeping practices? Uh, at arm's length, I think. It's one of those things where I get it and it's important and I see it coming in on various things where I think mm, that's not as sustainable as you're making that out. Um, so I, I, I'm trying not to fall foul of my own standards on that where as if I say, oh, I'm so sustainable now, I'm recycling all my water, I don't do water changes, I've, I'm using renewable energy, I'm only getting fish that are tank bred rather than wild caught or for each of those statements, there will be someone that will argue that that's not how you do sustainability. You should, you should be buying wild caught because that's supporting the areas where these fish are naturally kept. And if we don't support those areas, they'll die out. And then another faction will say no, because if you keep taking fish from there, they'll die out. So you can't please everyone. So that, that's kind of, I say, uh, at arm's length, because I, I'm, I'm scared to make a statement. I'm just kind of sitting on the fence with that one. Because uh, yeah. I, I get both, I get both. Um, every year I do a, um, a like a charity calendar giveaway thing, yeah. and this year was the, the Freshwater Life Project and the uh, I always struggle with this name, the Amazon Research for Ornamental Fishes, or something. Off. <clears throat> yeah, so we gave to them, um, and. I th I'm fully behind both of those causes. I think they're great. I, I did parts in the live streams and some videos about why I chose them. I mean, they were suggested by my subscribers, but others were suggested that I didn't pick, but I picked them and said that I think these are good ideas. And the amount of people that were like, no, they're terrible. You should have gone with this. You can't win. <laughs> so it's just I try and avoid that whole side of things as much as possible. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Very diplomatic answer. I'm very good at that. So I can sit on the fence like nobody's business. Uh, what's been the biggest surprise or unexpected unexpected aspect of running aquarium adventures for you? 
the biggest surprise. And I think it's probably the community. So I have people who I don't speak to them often. And when I do speak to like, so Brian, I instantly knew who that was and I felt comfortable enough to take the piss out of him a little bit like you would a friend. I've never met the guy. I might meet him one day. Um, these are There are people I have never met in real life who I spend more time with than some of my actual friends um, because they watch my videos, they turn up on my live streams and we talk about stuff that's not even fish sometimes. And I never thought that would be a byproduct of starting a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So I'll go with that. Cool, fair enough. I totally understand that as well. <clears throat> uh, can you share any tips or for capturing high quality photos or videos of aquariums? As I've mentioned before, Instagram sucks because it's really hard to get decent photos and videos of fish. How do you <clears throat> kind of come to that for your videos? Yeah, it's difficult. Um, I've even tried to make a couple of videos on how to improve your aquatic photography or aquatic videography. And then it's one of those, you know, when you said earlier about you make statements on the internet that people can track and call you out on. Oh, yeah. So then when I say, this is how you take great photos and great videos of your fish. And then three weeks later, they go, what is this abomination of a video you've shot out of focus? No light, can't see anything. So I'm, I'm a victim of my own um, statements sometimes. Ooh. But yeah. in general, more light than you think necessary. And once you've done that, double it. Um, every other light off because the reflections just ruin everything. So I've got one of these big massive hoods that I can put on the end of the camera. So if that's the, if that's the lens, there's a, a hood that's like, yay big that I can stick up against the glass when I want to take pictures. That works quite well. Um, but really, there's no substitute for light. Get as much light as possible, especially if it's a fast moving fish. Because the more light you've got, the more you can up your shutter speed and capture that fish rather than just capturing a blur. Um, other than that, I don't know anyone that doesn't have a digital camera now. So whether it's your phone or a digital camera, it's not like you're messing around with film anymore. Just yeah. take loads of pictures one of them will work and then the more you do it the better you get i think it's worth noting that the pictures that you see like in pfk they are edited hmm. the imperfections are removed for a lot of them before published so what you're seeing is not somebody just going bang they're maybe doing that a thousand times to get that image but then they're maybe and then they're running it through that. lots in their lightroom or something like that yeah. which making all the pop the colors pop or yeah mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff if you, if it is photography you're interested in then you probably already know about photography and it, it's really just apply all those same things but to f your subject is a fish now rather than that and the only difference with that is the reflections they get in the way so get up close get in get more light than you need and then you can let ai do its magic in lightroom and make it pop yeah so do you do all your work on a, a DLSR as opposed to a, um, a phone camera? Most of it, yeah. Um, I, I do occasionally take stuff with the phone just because it's handy. If I see something, I'll be like, oh, I'll whip the phone out and do that. But I have my, my Canon M50. I've got two of these, um, one that I'm talking to you now on my live stream, and then another one that I use to go around uh, and do my films or whatever but yeah i'll whip out the camera every now and again i've got a gopro somewhere that i have a fight with every week <laughs> because it, i try and like have a gopro set up on one of the tanks so when they have the live stream i can switch to it and it never bloody works and um, but i use that every now and again as well um yeah i'm not precious whatever's hanging around i'll give it a bash mm -hmm. cool cool uh, before you just get into more questions cam i'm just gonna have to say i need to head off um, I've got one of my kids and need me to do something. It's been really cool talking to you, Graham. Yes, um, nice to meet you. I'll, I'll catch up with you tomorrow night, guaranteed. Um, thanks, everybody, and thanks, Cam. I'll catch up with you later on tonight. With um, Cheers, Cheers, guys. Thank you. Right, bye. Nice to see you. Cheers, bye. Bye.
All right, cool. So, uh, looking forward, what are some of the goals or aspirations you have for your YouTube channel and your platform? <laughs> well, I did write down some goals. So, every year I do a how my channel is performing video at the end of the year as a, a kind of true up. Uh, so, my first goal for this year was I wanted to get to 25,000 subscribers, thinking that I wouldn't be able to do that because I haven't, my growth hasn't been able to sustain it but as of today i'm on 31 so tick one. job done. Well done um after that they're all things like i'm going to get out more i'm going to meet people face to face visit shops rather than just i sit in my little bubble taking videos editing not doing anything i want to go out and see some like some of the we've got some really good fish shops in this country um and if I have got any kind of audience, it's only fair that I go and give them a bit of a a platform to show off how good they are. Um, and for nothing else, I'm a hobbyist. I would like to see these shops. So if I can go and see them in person and do a bit of filming, great. Um, I haven't really set myself any other goals for this year. The other one that I have got written down is to not have my mega tank leak. And I need to find some wood to touch. Touch wood. We're we're doing okay so far this year. Yeah. So what's stopping you from from not going out to more shops, as an example? Laziness. Um, I I really struggle with. Hello, I'm a YouTuber. Oh, it brings me out in hives just saying that. Um, so. I struggle with going and say, is it all right if I come and film in your venue? Because if they say no, I'd be devastated. <laughs> um, and I still want to go anyway. And it's just, I'm in my safe little space and my safe little bubble. I don't want to leave my house. <laughs> I've become a hermit in my old age. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I understand that. Basically, if I'm not at work, I'm at home and I don't want to go anywhere from there. Yeah. Well, it, it, there is a practical side of it. So I'm meant to work eight hours a day, and then I have the kids. So one of my kids will be doing something every evening. So I'll be ferrying them to dance classes, acting, whatever it is, drama, karate, whatever it is. That takes time. And then at the weekends, you want to spend time with your family. That's it's. It feels a little bit... Uh, not greedy. I'm not sure what the word is, but it feels a little bit selfish to say, right, I'm I'm off to the other side of the country today. You take care of the kids there, and I'll see you when I get home, whenever that is. It's, mm. It takes two to run this family. Yep, I, I, I get that as well. Uh, just touching back on the, you know, asking a shop if you can film in there and then, you know, being told no. Um, obviously, I interview people, and the... You know, the amount of people we've asked to the amount of people that we get turned down from is, is still, it's up there. But after the first once or twice you get told no for whatever reason it happens to be, it just is what it is. You go, well, that's cool, and you, you kind of move on. So it's it's almost a bit of a don't want to put yourself out there worried about being rejected, but then it happens and you just kind of go forth. So I yeah. wouldn't allow to hold you back if you could avoid it. Well, yeah, I, I get that, but I... I used to operate on the principle of it's better to ask forgiveness than seek permission. But that feels a little bit too cheeky now. Whereas when when I was a tiny, tiny little channel and I could just whip my phone out and go, oh, look at what they've got here. This is great. Fantastic. That seemed okay then. But now that I, I might be doing that to a few thousand people watching it, that seems like it's a taking the piss a little bit. And it's not that's not necessarily a fear of rejection. It's just a fear of I, I literally have become a hermit. I don't want to go anywhere. And it, it feels like a struggle to engage with people. <laughs> I'm probably overselling it. It's not necessarily a the hardest thing in the world, but it's much easier to not, I guess. Yeah, I I, I, I understand. I get it. Things are far easier not to do them than to do them generally. Yeah, yeah. Which so then that's why I try and say, right, I'm going to have to do it because there's no reason not to. So yeah. pull your pull your socks up, Graham. Get out there and get it done. Yeah. yeah. 
do you have many fish shops quite close and local to you? Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, we have uh, a chain here called Maidenhead Aquatics that we've got all over the country, yep. which is pretty good. My local one, I know the guys that work in there. We have a chat when I go down, and they quite often give me their uh, surrendered fish that people have brought back in. They say, oh, Graham, he's got a massive tank. He'll take that. Uh, so they, they, they see me coming, let's put it that way. But yeah, that, that's a pretty good shop. Um, and even my kids like to go down there and feed the koi and things like that. So it's, yeah. that's a bit of a day out. There are some horrific ones as well, though. So I try and avoid them around around me. But I had I made friends with some people who ran fish shops, not local to me, but not that far away. But unfortunately, that shut down now. It's, it's a hard business, as I guess you know. Mm -hmm. It's not... It's not easy to be a, a small local independent fish shop, so they're few and far between, especially the good it's ones. Not, it's not glamorous, and you're not going to get a Ferrari anytime soon. I can assure you that. Yes. Something I'm always very envious of, <coughs> even if I speak to anybody uh, from the UK, is just the sheer amount that of local fish shops you guys have. It just seems like your industry, your hobby. Um, the whole lot is at a really strong point with the amount of people that are involved and the amount of shops that are about. Could be purely because it's just the amount of population that you have around as well, putting that in perspective. But it always seems like everyone we speak to have got a couple of local fish shops relatively close enough to, to have a couple of local fish shops to them. Yeah, I mean, the geography definitely helps. So I know like if it was the US or Australia or any of these places, you can literally be hundreds of miles away from civilization quite often. Mm. Whereas... Mm we are hundreds of miles away from the other end of the country so yep. <laughs> you will go through a lot of towns in there but we have we also have quite a well i don't know how good it is because i'm only a member of one of them but there's quite a lot of clubs and societies um which do a lot of work promoting the hobby and getting meets and get togethers and all that kind of stuff going on cool. um and, and they kind of cover most of the areas. So you're probably within the catchment area of one of the clubs, and if you're into it, you'll end up, dealing, whether you join them or not, you'll end up knowing about them and maybe going to an auction or maybe going to a talk or at least going on their Facebook page and finding out where the best shops are in your area and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's quite a, a rich... It often surprises me the amount of times I've been on... Uh, live streams in other parts of the world where people are asking for recommendations for good fish shops and they're few and far between purely because of the spread I guess but when you do it in a British one someone I think a couple of weeks ago said I'm traveling from I think it was Norfolk to Manchester where are some good fish shops to visit and there was like dozens of people were saying yeah this one or this one or, or that one or this one or that one so yeah, yeah definitely yeah. seems like a bit more fertile around here what do you look for in a fish shop when you when you go into them? Not much. <laughs> I, I don't. I try not to be too judgmental because I know how hard it can be, and I know there can be, like any small business, there are pressures that aren't just things that matter to a hobbyist. So it's a business first and foremost. So I shouldn't expect that they'll care just as much as me. So it's always nice when they do seem to. So that's probably the first thing is the attitudes. Mm -hmm. um, probably different from the chains than the independent stores. Because when you work at the chain, that's just people who work there. And they generally are hobbyists. And it's as, your store is as good as your staff at that point. The things that I'm not all that put off by the odd dead fish, it happens. Um, it's more about the attitudes of the staff and I'm not going in there expecting pristine tanks. I'm not going in there expecting the rarest fish in every tank and the best prices and all that kind of stuff. It's more about, is it a good selection? Is it generally clean, nice? I hate these dark and dingy little backstreet ones. Oh, they yeah. always, yeah, moldy, damp, horrible places to be. Um, but other than that, I'm not that precious about it. I'm just looking for something that's got good stuff in. I want. I actively want to support them. Yeah, cool. What's your favourite local shop here? 
at the moment it's the Maidenhead Aquatics because it is my local shop and it is pretty big and it's pretty good and the staff are pretty knowledgeable. Um, I even have some of the staff join me on my live stream. Um, so it's, they are hobbyists. Um, yep. So it's the kind of place you can go and have a chat and say, I mean, I get preferential rates as well sometimes, which is always nice. <laughs> That's quite good. Yep. But they know... But almost to a detriment, they know that I know about fish, so they quite often won't tell me things about fish. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. What is it? Tell me. Oh, you you'll know about this. And I'm like, no. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> so I get that a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're they're really good, and I really like that shop. And of all the chains, it's probably the best one that I've had as a chain. I had a favourite previous to that was there's a shop called Wharf Aquatics, which mm -hmm. is the place that's. It's got everything. It's it's yeah. like a maze. It's a warren, and they have all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And again, it's the staff that make it. They are hobbyists that happen to work in a fish shop as well, and they they do know all the stuff that's going on there. I had the privilege to go and work in a fish shop. Uh, so I had some friends over in Oldham who he the one that shut down. He ran that fish shop for a while, and I used to go over and visit them fairly regularly. They used to like dress me up in their t-shirts and make me serve customers and do clean tanks out and stuff like that. And shot some videos with them about day in the life of a fish keeper, just like yours, um, a fish shop owner. Um, so that was quite good. But again, I got to see behind the the curtain there of how hard it was to run that, and it was, that was probably what put me off any aspirations to have my own one day. Because uh, fair enough. I, I am lazy. I, I, I don't think I could do it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that brings us to the end of my structured questions that I have for you. I made it. <laughs> so now it is time for our school of six. Um, I was going to change them all up for you, but because I'm also lazy, I forgot all about changing them. <laughs> <so I've laughs> <ended> <laughs> well, as I'm also lazy, I forgot to study them. So I, oh, good. We're, we're fine. Cool. Uh, so, do you prefer tea or coffee? I'm a, I'm a neither. If anything, coffee. Coffee? Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, heads or tails? Tails. Tails, tails never fails. That's great. Uh, playing paper, scissors, rocks, what's your first call? Uh, I don't know if I should reveal this. <laughs> Uh, my kids will start beating me. It's usually paper. Cool. Uh, if you could have a meal with somebody alive, dead, fictional, it's from any time in the universe time, when would that be? Oh, who would that be? Sorry. Uh, you know, I've answered this question so many times on all these like team building exercises, and I don't think I've ever given the same answer twice. <laughs> I, I struggle with this one. Um, I don't know. Um, I kind of want to pick somebody like my great grandfather or something like that that I could quiz and ask about ancestry and things like that. Um, cool. I'll I'll go with that I'll, or John Claude Van Damme just to keep my life <laughs> happy. Um, are we alone in the universe? Uh, for now. For now. Okay. Cool. <laughs> what is your unicorn fish whether that be uh having it keeping it taking photos of it swimming with it breeding with it, it can be absolutely anything but what would be your unicorn fish mm. i realize dead air is not what you're meant to do in these situations but that's one of those questions i don't want to flippantly say oh stingray um, yeah Oh, that's a good one, that is. So for a long time, it has been a peacock bass, a timensis, mm -hmm. because I saw one in a shop once and thought it was the most awesome thing I'd ever seen. And that was one of the reasons I built Mega Tank was because that fish looked awesome and I knew that's going to need a big old tank to, to keep it. So I'm going to go with that because I still haven't got it. Okay, we'll roll with that. And I'm throwing a wee spanner in here. This is number seven of our six. Where can people find you if they're interested in what you do? 
uh, on YouTube usually, um, Aquarium Adventures on YouTube. You can find me on my Discord server. All the links are in the YouTube videos and that kind of stuff. Or just cool. send me an email, graham at aquariumadventures.co.uk. Fantastic. That is all that we have for you. I really appreciate your time with us. It's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you for having me. With us. Uh, if you haven't yet, do the whole like, subscribe, share, and all that kind of yada yada stuff. Um, other than that, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I hope everyone has a really nice day or evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. So, yeah, have a good one. Yes. Happy fish fishing. Catch you all later. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you very much.